Welcome to the September 12th Select Board meeting. This meeting is being called to order at 6.35. We had some technical difficulties there, so uh, if necessary, we will uh, make public comment go until five minutes later, till 6.50, so that we can get in the full 15 minutes. I want to announce before we start that we are here with Acting Town Manager Dave Zomack. As folks know, uh, Town Manager John Musanti had an accident last week, which he is recovering from. We'll receive an update on that later, but uh, tonight we have Mr. Zomack with, uh, with us, which we very much appreciate. Um, the other thing I'm going to say before we get started is, as I had um, made pretty clear at the last meeting that we had the discussion of the uh, housing and homelessness structure, um, situation that we were going to try as best we could to make this a working discussion of the select board tonight. There is, it's only possible that we will take public comment during that item, so we will take public comment now. Um, we will only take public comment as necessary during that item if we feel we need more information to make our decision. So with that, um, would folks like to make public comment tonight? First, I'm going to call on the gentleman who was, who was here first this evening just because he was here. So. Uh, we have a, several people. Just a show of hands, approximately how many people want to make public comment? Okay, so you're all looking at around uh, a minute and a half each <laughs> so that I can fit in as many people as possible because we do need to stop at 6.50. So please identify yourself for folks at home. Sure. Uh, my name is Sam Andrews, and I'm a uh, relatively new resident of the town. Uh, I moved here last December uh, after a 35-year absence from being here during college. Um, I think I probably read just about every uh, article, uh, letter to the editor, and editorial uh, over the last eight months or so on this issue or debate about the homeless shelter and the committee, and I just want to voice my support for it. Um, I've, I, through business and personal, I've had about 30 years of experience with town uh, governance and munis municipal entities and so uh, I am very aware of the fact that the select board has enough on their plate already and as valuable as the zoning board or the audit committee or the personnel board or what have you uh, to you so is the homeless committee so it, I would I would urge you to um, uh, support it instead of dismantling it and um, empower it even more uh, for the oversight of the shelter and homelessness in the town as a whole, as an issue. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Appreciate you coming in. Other folks, um, folks we haven't heard from before, um, Mr. Kustner, we haven't heard from you on this issue. And please be as brief as possible so we can fit in as many folks as possible and identify yourself. I'll try. Rob Kustner, a uh, former colleague of yours, and uh, welcome Mr. Zomek in the role. I hope John's better soon. I'll be brief. Uh, in 2007, I was a member of the board that uh, created the Committee on Homelessness, and um, the reason we did it was we felt that uh, such committee filled a role that ha wasn't being filled by any other town committee. I realize and respect and even applaud the review you've made of uh, its role over the past few years and I think it's important to do that sort of thing to review and reconsider decide whether such a such a committee is appropriate or not I applaud you guys for thinking of instituting a, an oversight board that's separate from the Committee on Homelessness but as the previous speaker indicated I think there is a role for advocacy among town committees and boards. There's a role for boards to be at odds with each other. I think we learn from that. The dialectical experience, whatever you want to call it, is sometimes valuable. And I think if you guys can create an entity that provides appropriate oversight to the day-to-day -day activities and encourages the members of the committee to appropriately engage with that oversight board, I think you'll create something that's better and more effective in the end for addressing what's really a serious problem. We, we were concerned, seriously enough, to create the committee almost as an emergency back in late 2007. I think now would be a, an awful time to abandon that committee. So I hope you'll move forward with some of the positive things you're doing and consider these comments in light of some experience with the issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other folks? We haven't heard from on this issue. Ms. Munir Gotti. And please identify yourself. My name. 
My name is Eleanor Meneer Gotti. I have served on the Amherst Committee for, on Homelessness for several years. This committee is a group of special people who have significant understanding and experience of the pain and struggle of being homeless. Be being homeless is bad under any circumstance, but is increasing with the worsening and deterioration of our economic system. Therefore, the Amherst Committee on Homelessness is needed more than ever. We have been criticized for mi micromanaging the shelter, but we have seen problems that we thought should have been corrected. Our biggest sin was wanting the best for the dispossessed. There is no objective criteria to measure the worth of the Committee on Homelessness. This committee has done much good for the poor of Greater Amherst and deserves a longer life. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Other folks who would like to speak, uh, Mr. Marin. And uh, I have some experience of a number of years of working with the homeless uh, from 1985 to 1995. And I was on the committee that established the task force, then the committee. And uh, I think that uh, we did a very good job in, in, in uh, supporting the homeless uh, during the, most of the time that I've seen. But I, the reason I'm here is because I read a report at, by a, uh, a reporter in the uh, newspaper which talked about oversight. And uh, I think it was mentioned that there were 100 visits uh, during the last year uh, of 300 days. Something, I don't know if I have the exact figure. Something like that, 100 visits by members of uh, the town uh, in 300, uh, uh, three, uh, well, 100 visits anyway. Anyway, what I'm saying specifically, to be more specific, is that I think there should be a criteria established for how the oversight is conducted so it's within reason and that it can be, uh, and, and it, it can't upset people. It shouldn't upset social workers and it shouldn't upset town residents who are advocates for the homeless either. And I would say that a good rule of thumb, a barometer uh, would be that uh, if there's a homeless committee, and there probably, I think there should be a homeless committee, they should have two visits a month to evaluate the shelter. And uh, that those two visits uh, and their, uh, their reports should be taken seriously and, and uh, addressed where necessary. I mean, that's, a, you know, I'm saying that some criteria should, should be established so that we don't have over oversight, which upsets people or no oversight, which is no good. That's all. Thank you very much. Anyone else who has not spoken on this issue before, before I get to folks who have? Ms. Gray. Uh, Carol Gray, Precinct 7, 815 Southeast Street. Um, I'm speaking in favor of maintaining the Homelessness Committee, and uh, I'd like to speak to a couple points. One is, the importance of governance through our town committees. I have seen that part of the proposal uh, that was handed on the back table is to create a shelter resource group that would be, quote, a pool of folks available to Dave Zomack when needed. Um, it's advisory, I, at least this is what I'm quoting from the handout, advisory, but the real power does not lie in that situation with the, t with the committee, with the people. And our town has traditionally been run with major decision making being made through town meeting, the select board, the planning board, and town committees. I don't think the homelessness issue should be taken out of that arena of citizen control. Another point is that this c we're very lucky in this community to have people who are so passionate about t trying to serve the homelessness community. You know, people die when they're homeless in the winter. Sometimes they freeze to death, even in Hampshire County. And w so we have a committee where people are very zealous, more zealous than maybe some members of town hall or of the select board are comfortable with. But we should be grateful that we have such a zealous committee. They're not always going to agree. But I don't think we should start a precedent where when we don't like a committee being zealous, we dismantle them. That's not a way to run a town, I don't think. We should be able to deal with difference and allow a zealous committee to work on its differences without uh, setting the, the idea that any committee that um, 
advocates a little too much might be dismantled. That would not, that would be very unfortunate, and I hope that the select board will not follow that path. Thank you very much. Okay, folks, we have already spoken. Ms. Demila. Uh, my name is Rika Simula Gerding. Although I am the vice chair of the Committee on Homelessness, I am here tonight to speak as a private citizen. I want to address the two points made by the chair of the select board in her July 25th notes on discussion for new committee charge. The select board chair saw Milestone's voluntary departure as a setback for the town to attract a high quality shelter operator and felt that the Committee on Homelessness has done too much advocacy for the people who are homeless or at risk of becoming homeless. In my opinion, the lack of oversight by the town on milestones last winter is what precipitated the impression that the Committee on Homelessness provided too much oversight and was too involved in the operational minutiae minutia of the shelter. The fact that none of the staff, or for that matter, none of the select board members had been to the shelter during its operation last year is in stark contrast to the fact that the members of our committee volunteered, not as committee members, but as private citizens, on nearly 100 nights combined during the shelter's 180 nights of operation. The extent of the oversight provided by the town was merely through phone conversations and periodic written reports by the shelter operator. This is simply not enough. Your criticism of our committee's over-involvement would be better placed on the town's lack of supervision of the shelter. To move forward, please stop blaming the committee but start examining on how the town can exercise its oversight role as the entity that will be providing over $100,000 this winter. Good oversight is what will ensure a high quality shelter that will benefit our homeless residents. The town can attract a high quality shelter operator only if the town holds the shelter operator accountable. This winter is a fresh start. Please work with our committee and learn what makes a shelter a high quality place that respects and safeguards the well-being of our homeless residents. Secondly, the charge of the committee is to make policy recommendations to you, the select board, on how best to address homeless problems and to assist the town and town manager to implement policy recommendations. Yes, I agree, through policy recommendation and implementation, the committee is indeed advocating for the homeless or those on the verge of becoming homeless. However, I am puzzled by why our committee is being faulted for doing our work. Is it because homeless people, like myself, who has been homeless many times in life, are less worthy? than say a tree, a soccer field, or historical building. The Shade Tree Committee advocates for preservations of trees in public ways. Leisure Services and Supplemental Education Commission advocated for construction of Plum Brook soccer field and the creation of other recreational faci facilities. Council on Aging advocates for the senior citizens to ensure the programs and services provided will meet their needs. Conserva Conservation Commission preserves and promotes the preservation of open space. Historical Preservation Commission advocates for the protection of historic and architecturally significant properties. To do their jobs and to fulfill their official charges, these boards and committees work to advocate for their stakeholders. What makes it legitimate to advocate for some but not for others? I believe safe and decent sheltering, like health care, is one of the human rights. When some segment of our population in this country will experience homelessness at the rate of one out of 100 people, this makes homelessness a significant issue. If the committee does not advocate for these people, what other boards or committees in town will? I come before you today not to ask for your pity. I am in a very financially difficult situation in my life. My housing situation is not the best. I personally know 60 or 70 other people in Amherst that are in the same situation. We might double up or sleep on someone's couch for the night. We do not know where we might end up sleeping the next night. I am blessed to have friends who can help me. You are all very blessed to have a home to go back to, but let us remember those who are struggling and do not have a roof over their heads. Winter is coming. The Committee on Homelessness has recommended Craig's door. 
a very qualified agency to run the shelter this winter. I have every confidence they will provide the best sheltering experience for our homeless residents. In my experience with them, I know they treat the homeless with respect and dignity. This is something very hard to come by. I hope the town will consider their application for the shelter operation. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you very much. So I have to put an end to public comment now, but uh, all of you coming in and expressing yourselves is very much appreciated, so thank you very much. Um, we are running five minutes late in the agenda already. Um, is there anybody here for the Stavros? Still need to touch the public and visitor and extra no. Um, is I won't give you an extra five minutes. Is there anybody here from the Stavros Center for the for that request? Okay, then our 650 item, we'll deal with the Star Rose parking request as an untimed item. Uh, we are now have the 650 item as a ceremony honoring the Amherst African American Civil War veterans and we have veterans agent Steve Connor and Mr. Bob Romer here to speak to us about that. And if you could both identify yourself, please. Uh, yes, my name is Steve Connor. I'm the Director of Veterans Services. And I'm, I'm Bob Romer, Precinct 5 and 10th Ward of the Town of Amherst. That's my official position. I guess I represent the impromptu committee on recognizing our black Civil War veterans. Uh, let me take a couple of minutes to explain how we got where we are <coughs> and what we plan to do. <coughs> I've given you folks a very brief handout, which I actually put together for a talk I agreed to give tomorrow at the Amherst Club, but I thought I'd bring it along to you. Only a couple of years ago, I used to run six miles every morning. Now I walk three miles every morning in about the same length of time. And I go various directions from my house. And on the day before Memorial Day, I just happened to go through West Cemetery and I noticed all the new flags out on the veterans' graves for Memorial Day, and uh, since I know about the graves of some black Civil War veterans, I was looking forward to seeing their flags, uh, for instance, for Charles Finnamore, who uh, fought in the Mass 54th, whom I have known, so to speak, for 10 years now, and there was no flag. And I noticed other flags, uh, other sites without flags, and I thought this is a problem that needs to be fixed and uh, who's gonna fix it? Well, first of all, me. So uh, my wife and I went to Hastings and bought some flags and put them in the ground. And then this has to be fixed more permanently. So I went to see Steve Connor, our veterans agent, who agreed, yes, we have to fix this and uh, let's make a ceremony out of this, which I thought that was a great idea. And that's how we got started. By the way, I'm absolutely sure that the not having the flags on those particular sites was simply an accident. Uh, we probably don't have great records as to which gravestones need flags. Is that true, Steve? Yeah. <laughs> and we thought about doing this in July, and Reynolds Winslow, who has agreed to MC the ceremony, said let's wait until after Labor Day. Because, and that was a good idea because since then we have learned a great deal more about these men. For instance, uh, there's Mars Janalvin, who is buried in West Cemetery, and as of May, I would say no one in Amherst knew who he was. Uh, no one, not even Jim Smith. Uh, we didn't know whether he was black or white, whether he was really a veteran, and now with a little clicking and some help clicking on the computer from uh, Kate Boyle at Jones and my son and his wife in Binghamton, uh, we now know a great deal about Janelle and Mars. And uh, I decided it would be really nice if we could find some descendants of these guys, but I am obviously incompetent so far at genealogy because I concluded that there were no living descendants. And then Scott Mertzbach wrote a story about this in the Bulletin and the Gazette, and I discovered the easy way to do research. You notice a little problem, you fix it, somebody writes a story about it, and then you sit back and you wait for emails from people you never heard of, 
who were sending you information you didn't know you wanted. Uh, the first thing that happened was I got an email from uh, William Harris in Los Angeles, who uh, I'd like to say that he reads the Gazette online every day, but actually it was his mom in Greenfield who put him onto this. And he told me about his family. Uh, of the five men that we are specifically honoring next Sunday, there are three Thompsons, and their descendants include William Harris of LA and his brother Dan in Andover. They include Dudley Bridges, who died a few years ago. They include the famous Gil Roberts, our banjo player, who's on the mural at West Cemetery. And there are scads of relatives in this family. Quite a few of them are coming. And just for instance, Christopher Thompson is Dan and William Harris's great, great, great grandpa. Every year we honor our veterans, but this is the first time that we have specifically honored our black Civil War veterans. And uh, so we're honoring five men in particular out of the 20 black Amherst men who fought for the Union and the Civil War, including three of the five Thompsons who fought. And <coughs> excuse me, it means a great deal to these descendants who are coming that the town of Amherst is honoring their, their ancestors. So we've arranged a program for Sunday. We've got the two choirs of Hope Church and AME Zion Church, which are our two originally all black churches who are doing a couple of musical numbers jointly. We're having a color guard of some kind. Steve knows all about that. The two pastors, uh, Crystal Roberson from Hope is here and the pastor of AME Zion are participating. We're gonna have remarks by family members and others, including me because Charles Finnamore <coughs> has no descendants to speak for him. We have a bugler to play taps. We have the UMass ROTC, I think, is we hope. We, we hope, yeah. And uh, we were hoping to lead off with some welcoming remarks for the town by Mr. Musanti and maybe we can get Mr. Zomack to come instead. And afterwards, there will be a public reception at Hope Church. And I might add that this costs the town essentially nothing, right? A dollar or two for electricity, maybe at uh, West Cemetery. So it's a generator, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so that's where we are, and the weather forecast Right now, it looks great. I don't believe them five days in advance, but it looks <laughs> terrific. So Steve and I are here to take questions. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for all of the work, all the research that you did, and all the effort you've put into making this ceremony happen. Um, I just want to reiterate for folks that this ceremony is going to be Sunday, September 18th at 2 o'clock p.m. at West Cemetery. And as you stay here, this is rain or shine. Okay. Um, and this is on the town website, is that correct, Mr. Zomer? I believe it is, yes. Okay, and any place people should go if they're looking for more information or to have questions answered? They, sorry. they can call my office um, either at uh, the Amherst office of 259-3028 or they can contact the main office 587-1299 and we can fill anybody in on any details. Okay. If you can't get Steve, you can get me. My home number is 253-7748. Wonderful. Any questions or comments from the select board? All right. Thank you. That's, that's very exciting, and that, that's a wonderful thing to have as part of our history and culture going forward, and it's nice to know that those graves now will always be decorated on, on Veterans Day. Thank, Thank you much. both so much. We look forward so to the Mr. ceremony. Zomack, we will see you at o'clock <laughs> on yes. Sunday. Thank and you. I will be in touch with both of you before the weekend. Thank okay, because we're holding you to it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much. <coughs> okay, so no one is here from Stavros, so we will deal with the Stavros question. Um, the parking request later on as an untimed item that was uncertain whether they would be attending or not. Um, folks came up. <coughs> okay. For our seven o'clock item, 
This is part of the continuing conversation that we've been having over the past several meetings regarding housing and homelessness uh, and how the town addresses that. We have been talking about whether, um, considering all of the circumstances, the very changed landscape that we now uh, exist in with a, an existing homelessness shelter with so much progress having been made on the town's sheltering issues in the last couple of years, whether the structure that we're working with, with homelessness as well as uh, housing partnership, fair housing, is the best way to address our needs going forward. Um, folks did mention during public comment that this was about criticism of the Committee on Homeless or that, um, that their advocacy wasn't as valuable as other committees and, um, and so I'm simply going to reject those stipulations and those characterizations of the situation. Um, th what the Select Board is trying to do is make sure we are taking the information um, that we have now and making sure we're making the best uh, decisions going forward. So we've been looking very in depth at the structure and as part of this, oh and the other thing I'll mention before we go on is um, folks were concerned about the end of public comment. I just want to mention that yes, while indeed the meeting did start five minutes late, public comment continued five minutes late also. So we had the full 15 minutes of public comment. So that you were not denied that. Okay. so. We, um, at our last discussion, the select board spent a lot of time identifying what the particular needs are for the town to address uh, homelessness issues going forward, to make sure whatever structure we deal with, whatever structure we end up with, dealt with those particular needs. After that meeting, uh, in conversations with Mr. Zomek, who is the, uh, when he's not being acting town manager, is, um, is the uh, point person and manager of the sheltering team uh, for the town. He is Mr. Musanti's point person on dealing with all of the operational and oversight issues of the town. And we realized that as we talked about the kinds of oversight needs that there are, what we needed to have was a picture from the town of what had been happening. So I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Zomek now, who has uh, several members of his sheltering team here. He has a um, document here that uh, has been made available to the audience and the select board is just receiving. And uh, thank you, Mr. Zomek. Thank you very much, Ms. O'Keefe. Um, I just want to take a moment and, and acknowledge the select board. Thank you very much um, for asking me to step in for John. Uh, I know John is a very big uh, baseball fan, as am I, and I look at this as kind of pinch hitting for Mr. Musanti while he's recovering, and we wish him well, and we'll have an update on his condition in a few minutes. If I could, I might ask Captain Gunderson and uh, our health director, Julie Fetterman, if they might join me up at the microphone. Um, they provided some of the background on our efforts um, last season. So if I could, I'll, I'll try to be uh, fairly brief. I do want to give um, um, uh, Julie and Captain Gunderson a chance to uh, add some of their comments and perhaps some, uh, some additional information around the edges. Um, prior to Mr. Musanti's um, um, Accident. Uh, he had asked us part of our part of his sheltering team that he put together over a year ago to come in and make some comments relative to the conversation we're having this evening and and one that's been going on for some months. Um, I guess I want to start very briefly by saying that, you know, I very much would like to to celebrate the positive of what happened last uh, uh, season, the 2011-12 uh, season. Uh, excuse me, 10-11 season was a. a a fantastic sheltering season for Amherst. We made great strides from the year before. Um, three years ago, we didn't have a shelter. Uh, we transitioned into something called the warming place. Uh, that was a, a step forward, and I think we made great strides last year in operating a very, very successful um, shelter. I think Mr. Musanti's comments at earlier meetings have, have been um, very much in line with that. Uh, we should be very proud working with the committee, working with residents, and especially working with our two partners, Milestone Ministries, and uh, our wonderful, wonderful partner at First Baptist Church. Um, we put together a terrific, terrific uh, sheltering um, season and kept people safe and warm and fed throughout the, the, the winter. Um, I want to briefly go through and quickly go through uh, what I've outlined here for you is really the team that Mr. Musanti put together of myself, 
Ms. Fetterman, um, Ms. Weeks, our building commissioner, Captain Gunderson and her staff, and Mr. Rosenblatt and Ms. Taylor provided our C CDBG administration. We worked very closely, as I said, with, uh, with Jack DeRoche and his staff, Frank Kelly, um, uh, the shelter coordinator, and of course our wonderful, wonderful contact at First Baptist, Jerry um, Gates. Um, the, the sheltering team really was many months in, in preparation for the, the season itself. Um, Mr. Musanti asked us to really oversee, asked me and our, our wonderful team to oversee everything from permitting, contracting, and the actual oversight of the shelter during the season. Um, we, I was the designated lead contact, um, and we worked very closely with Milestone from the point of contracting to the final report that was um, uh, produced in May. Um, I, I take great pride in the amount of communication that went on between our staff, and I'm gonna let um, 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 my two colleagues in a minute um, add to this, but I take great pride in the amount of communication and the amount of outreach we did, um, the amount of communication feedback between and among staff, milestone, volunteers, uh, I think was fantastic and really the, the result of that was a wonderful end product. I think um, by anybody's measure, the shelter that everyone contributed to, including the business community and many others and volunteers in this, in this town was uh, simply a, a terrific product. Um, Members of our shelter management team made uh, numerous visits to the shelter, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, uh, we reviewed and uh, went over uh, with some diligence uh, all the reports that Milestone uh, provided for us, both the financial reports as well as the documentation of the social service work that they and uh, their partners were doing at the shelter. Um, and again, members of our team communicated regularly with representatives from, from Milestone about ongoing issues, um, issues related to weather, uh, issues related to uh, any uh, updates on behavior, on capacity, et cetera. So I think it was a very, very um, comprehensive approach to sheltering in, in, in the season. I will say, as always, there's room for improvement. And I think what we're trying to do um, is really used last year as a springboard for e an even better season this year. So let me turn it over perhaps to uh, um, Ms. Fetterman and, and Captain Gunderson and see if they have anything they'd like to add based on their, their pieces of the uh, report that they provided. Um, so as, uh, as Mr. Zomek has, has said, I think one of the key <coughs> things that happened last year was that there was a lot of communication by telephone, in person, and by email um, between the health department, building department, police, fire, and Milestone Ministries. Um, in terms of the health department, I made one two-hour visit to the shelter after, after it had been operating for a few weeks. Um, Prior to that, we had all done inspections um, when the facility was being used as a warming center and then pre-operationally for the shelter. Uh, so we knew going into it that we had a physical facility that was all set. Um, in terms of food preparation and sanitation, that was something that um, I worked with um, Jack DeRoches on <coughs> from Milestone Ministry, and I was very happy with the food plan that was finally decided upon. Um, during my visit, um, one of the things that impressed me the most was uh, the actual staffing, the, e the nighttime staffing that was there. Um, they had excellent protocol for sanitation, for m managing food service, for interacting with the clients, and I was very impressed with what I saw that night. Um, I did continue throughout the season to have conversations uh, with Jack DeRoches and also with Peg Keller and um, Pamela Schwartz who are part of the regional effort on, on sheltering. I felt that it was really important that Milestone be part of that regional conversation. Um, and I, I couldn't have been more pleased with what I saw and with the communications that I had. Uh, there was no need to go back for another visit from the health point of view 
partly because police was there so frequently. So we had that constant contact that if there were any issues that would involve food or sanitation, that that information would be coming to us through the police department. And if I could just also echo what Julie said, really this year the communication was, was great, not only in the town, but also with, with Milestone uh, that was operating a shelter. Uh, our focus and goal this year was, was to really emphasize the safety, safety first of the guests that are at need out in the streets that we could get to the shelter, um, the guests that were already at the shelter and the employees. So to tackle that issue, we assigned a consistent face every single evening. It was primarily Officer Linda Newcomb, who was the liaison officer to the shelter. She got to know very well the guests and the staff and the management and the volunteers that were at the shelter. And we felt that that was um, very successful to having her build a relationship, not only with the staff, but with the guests. And on those very rare occasions when uh, Linda's uh, nightly visit had to take a little bit of a different role, in, in enforcement is probably too strong of a word, but um, I if somebody had to be removed from the shelter, she gained voluntary compliance, um, which we really felt that that was something that we, we wanted to have, that we wanted Linda to be able to go there the next night with that same guest and be able to have a decent relationship with that guest and with other ones. Um, we think that the operation of the shelter and the communication with Milestone and their trust in Officer Linda Newcomb really made that possible. If I could also um, highlight, uh, I think I already discussed the couple of issues that we needed to, um, to address. Oh, talking about the amount of times. You know, something that, that we were guided on. The previous year we did try to show up a lot of the nights, but we'd show up at midnight and one. And you know, we were really educated. Like, this is a place where people are resting. Why would you send your officers to go there so late? And that just really, it just hadn't dawned on us to do that, so Linda worked very hard to try to get there by nine o'clock when people were showing up and uh, you know, when people were ready to have some conversation and discussion. We also wanted the midnight shift going there, so they'd go in the morning when it was breakdown time. Not as consistently, just because of the scheduling and, and other duties and requirements they had in the morning, but just so they would be able to have, they couldn't go at midnight when they started their shift, there were some very rare occasions that they were called there, say at two or three in the morning, but so they could also meet um, with the guests and the staff. So we said seven o'clock would really be a target there. So we felt it was successful. Thank you. Mr. Zomek, anything else you'd like to add before we start asking you questions? No. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the kinds of communications that you would get from um, shelter management, shelter guests, and um, so the kinds of issues that those were about and what you would do to deal with them? Just have a sense of, of the kinds of things that you were dealing with on a, on a daily and weekly basis. Sure, I think one of the bullets speaks broadly to that. Um, this was the type of, of season and the type of operation where we could get, I could get, emails or phone calls really 24 seven. Um, and Mr. Mizanti uh, got used to getting calls from me, uh, follow up calls from me if those issues were of a, of a level that he needed to weigh in on. Um, but there was always a back and forth between um, the Milestone staff, particularly Frank Kelly, who was fantastic in there most nights, myself, uh, Mr. Mizanti, particularly on issues, uh, for instance, uh, during the, the, the couple of uh, cold weather, weather spells that we had, um, but issues around capacity. Um, uh, for the most part, uh, the behavior-based uh, uh, admission policy uh, worked quite well. Um, I can tell you that we, I never took any call from the Amherst Police Department. I think Officer Newcomb did a fantastic job. These were mostly check-ins between Milestone and myself on uh, how to proceed if a certain circumstance uh, presented itself. But uh, I think it's no exaggeration in my memo that I, I state that there were literally hundreds of phone calls, emails, and ultimately meetings. Milestone was, was in, the, in this building many, many times throughout the season, 
uh, meeting with myself, with Ms. Fetterman, or uh, Mr. Musanti on three or four occasions. So it was a, a very fluid situation, and I feel very good about our, our communication, and I think it resulted in a very good product. As I said earlier, this is an evolution of where we were two, three, four years ago when we had nothing, and I think each year we're getting better and better. Um, and I, I think it would be hard to argue that that's not true. We're getting better um, for a variety of reasons, but um, I think our oversight of the contract uh, was very good. We learned some things. We'll ask for, and we have uh, in, the, in, in the new RFP that went out uh, a few weeks ago, uh, some additional feedback as part of the feedback loop for the town, uh, particularly from guests. And so the new provider, whoever that will be, will be required to provide that as well. Um, but I will say that I took calls from guests myself uh, during the season and then immediately was on the phone to Frank Kelly or Jack DeRoche directly to try to figure out the circumstances of those situations. Thank you. I'll ask one more question then open it up to select board. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about things that you learned from this year and that you would change going forward? And that would be a question for both of you also. Any any kind of specific things that you're going to be looking to do that um, that you learned? So you spoke about feedback, and that's very valuable. I think the feedback loop will be very important. I, I, I think um, getting input from the guests um, you know, throughout the season and, and uh, right up through the last month or so, um, we've talked about and what ended up in the RFQ, which is a public document, are things like um, surveys throughout the year, um, not having season um, quarterly surveys or something of that sort, but but giving the guests an opportunity to to um, um, submit uh, surveys and, and input nightly, perhaps even as simple as a suggestion box. We've also talked about things like having a hotline some sort of hotline that guests could call if there are problems at the shelter that could be a, a, an impartial um, um, person to simply um, weigh the, the cir circumstances of the concern about the shelter and then follow through with the town and or the provider. Thank you. Did either of you have anything you wanted to add about specific things that you had learned from this year and that you'd be looking to change going forward? I just know that when we looked back at, at our interaction at the shelter, we were surprised that our overnight shift um, wasn't as consistent as we originally thought they'd be. We thought it would be four out of six days that we would be able to have an officer go by there. So we want to be a little bit more consistent. So Linda is the primary, but we want the guests and staff there to be able to see another face of ours in the morning. Thank you. Mr. I might. Two other quick pieces um, in in this evolution of, of and, and and as we get better and better uh, collectively as a community in doing this, I think two other pieces that have have come to light. One is um, the notion that if we can provide some, if the town um, um, or within Amherst can provide some services during the day, I know that some of the faith faith based um, organizations are looking at whether they could provide some sort of um, uh, an outreach space during uh, the day for people who are homeless, a place where people can get warm during the day, but also perhaps um, get some services. That would be a wonderful addition to our, our, um, um, our efforts. Um, the other piece that, you know, uh, I, uh, our partner at First Baptist Church is doing a terrific job, but I know that Jerry Gates uh, is looking at whether there's any possibility to open the shelter a little bit earlier. Um, uh, that was a bit of a challenge from time to time. Uh, certainly that late start of the shelter opening was, was always challenging, but um, we're lucky to be there and, and we're very uh, grateful. So um, we'll, we'll leave that up to the new provider and, and the town to work with First Baptist on. Thank you. And Ms. Fetterman, anything uh, else that you wanted to add about things you learned before? No, nothing, on? just I would echo what Mr. Zomek said that um, it does seem that it would be quite important to have some type of daytime services. Um, social services offered in the evening is not really the best time to meet this population's need. Um, and so to have that happening during the daytime, I think would be a really important piece to work on this year. Thank you. Select board members, questions for Mr. Zomek, Captain Gunderson, or Ms. Fetterman? Okay. 
Well, thank you, uh, Ms. Brewer, were you raising your hand? No. Uh, <laughs> was I raising my hand? Yes, actually. I, I would like to get a sense, because we're talking about some of the changes and some of the things that ended up in the RFP, which I know I looked at as the liaison to the Committee on Homelessness, and some of the things I think we were just trying to be more specific about, others we left somewhat open. For example, when we talk about surveys, we mentioned that in the monthly reports, which were previously not required to have as much detail monthly, the monthly reports will now have more details, many more questions. And if there is some type of survey instrument or feedback instrument, whether it be some combination of the different things you talked about, that that would be reported in there. However, it doesn't actually require a specific kind of feedback mechanism. Again, talking more, I think, like we've talked about here recently as a board, what we want to know rather than the method of obtaining it. And so, but knowing that we want that feedback loop. Um, one of the big changes that we made when we went from having a warming shelter to having an overnight shelter, some of the issues that we really wrestled with and the Committee on Homelessness were really helpful to us about at that time, we had very long conversations with Ms. Fetterman and other groups, were associated around the behavior-based policy, whether or not we'd be able to serve both genders and provision of a hot meal. Those were all big changes from the time, not only were we letting people sleep, <laughs> actually, which is what we'd wanted, but we were also looking at those particular issues. Moving into this next overnight season, I don't see that we have made any policy shifts in what we're planning to do and what services we're planning to provide. I can hear some things that we want to do that we might ha do more consistently in terms of you know that nice interaction between the police department and that we're asking for more detail on reports and so we're making some tweaks to things like that. I'm not seeing any big policy shifts from last season to this season and I just wanted to to see if that was your sense also, because I think we've learned so much moving from the warming to the overnight that really, although we want to constantly improve things, there are no big changes in store. The hours are going to be the same, the number of people we can serve, obviously the facility is the same, et cetera. My understanding, the feedback I got from Mr. Musanti and, and from the board prior to the RFP going out was that there were no uh, um, significant policy shifts. You, you named the three that were in the RFP and, and, and formed the foundation of the, of the um, shelter last year. And we, we rebuilt the RFQ around those same three uh, policies, but there were some tweaks and there was some um, uh, buffering and, and uh, building up of some of the feedback mechanisms in, in the RFQ, um, but there were no major policy shifts. Other questions or comments from select board? Mr. Heaton. Yeah, I'd like to sort of a, a, a beginning comment. Um, you know, I, I've not been as directly involved in this as, as Ms. Brewer, for instance. Um, I want to appreciate uh, Mr. Kuzner's and Ms. Greeney's um, uh, efforts in establishing the Committee on Homelessness. Um, certainly, um, it's a noble experiment. I have a sense that four years ago, when we entered into this, we hadn't a clue um, what um, service, now let me be careful when I define we, certainly many people, the police department, the health department had a sense of the services that the homeless in town needed. The select board may not have, and I think it is a noble effort that they put together this committee on homelessness to begin to understand the issues and to bring um, resources, town resources to bear. Um, what, what is exciting uh, at this juncture is that we have the experience of those four years, two of which include um, actually operating and, and, and watching the operation of, of um, an overnight shelter. And um, I'd like to point out that uh, we have um, significant responsibilities over the police department and the fire department, and I can't say that I've uh, ridden on the fire truck in at least uh, 15 years, and somehow I didn't think that's okay. Um, any event, um, I really appreciate what we, what I, have learned about the issues that get lumped together in under this, this homeless, homelessness label. And in fact, um, the, the, the members of the committee who've been, who've been seeing us uh, week after week helped me understand um, 
that there are five areas that need to be looked at. Um, and, and this was defined by them, and, and you know, I'm, I'm trying to sort of make them clear to myself. First of all, that it is a regional problem. That since we opened up a shelter that, um, that had um, among uh, some of the easiest rules for entrance of all of the shelters in the area, a lot of people have come and have admitted to coming from places that are 30 and 40 miles away. Um, there is a need for emergency shelter. There are people who will find themselves without a place to spend the night on these very, very cold nights that we experience sometimes in New England. Um, the committee also helped me understand that um, a lot of the guests, a lot of the people who take advantage of the services of an overnight shelter, a warming shelter, any of these, these homeless services, are people who are not able, for whatever reason, to um, uh, be maintained in permanent housing. Um, and that it really needs to be part of the effort to give them the help that they need to be able to um, qualify and even to, to take on the responsibilities of a permanent home. Um, related to that, but very separate issues, of course, is finding a permanent place for people who would otherwise be homeless. Um, SROs, ESROs, those are all things that are out there. And last of all, um, there is, again, a different and uh, related but separate requirement for many of these guests um, to get um, access to social services. Um, social services as basic as, you know, get the third meal in the day. Um, as to, you know, getting the aid that is available. Um, I, I don't know how generous Massachusetts or Amherst is relative to the country, but I have a sense that there is a great deal of generosity. I know Cheryl Zoll is working very, very hard um, I, you know, was really um, kind of amazed at First Baptist Church's efforts along these lines. Milestone Ministries, the other, their other part of the work. There's a lot of stuff going on that, that we wouldn't have known um, if the, um, the committee hadn't helped us. Um, having said all of that, tonight uh, we're speaking about only one-fifth of that, this emergency shelter. Um, and... Um, I don't know how to untangle everything else out of that, um, except maybe to say that we really do need to, um, or else it's going to be hard to uh, administer an effective contract. Okay, so that's a good segue if nobody else has, uh, if Ms. Lightford has questions for the shelter management team. Okay, so what we did last time is we talked a great deal about um, what is the town's role in addressing homelessness needs and what bases do we want to make sure that we cover with whatever structure we have going forward we have a current structure and now we're looking at um, a potential new structure um, and we came up with through great discussion um, and based on various sets of uh, notes and recommendations that had been provided by myself, Ms. Brewer, and Ms. Stein, all of which are available on the website. Some of them are in today's packet, the September 12th packet, um, a, almost, uh, I think the entire package of everything we've talked about um, before tonight is available on the August 8th meeting packet. So folks can go there if they're interested. Um, and we have had a great deal of feedback from folks um, along the way, lots of emails, lots of, uh, there have been letters to the editor, et cetera, about this. Um, so we have sort of put all of that information together, and at the last meeting we spent a long time talking about what were the key needs that we feel the town needs to meet and not looking at the structure for meeting them, but just identifying those needs. And so I'll just review those. Um, the need to review and give feedback on the shelter RFP that uh, an a mechanism is needed for continued collection and processing of feedback on shelter operations. That focus, and we need to focus on assuring future emergency shelter well needed. Need to focus on securing permanent shelter. Need to focus on permanent housing. Focus on transitional support necessary for successful permanent housing. And focus on regional efforts and how Amherst fits into that. 
And that was what we decided is really those, those elements are within the town's appropriate role here. Now, there will be differences of opinion about other things that the town should do, but these are the things that the select board agreed are, are the things that we want to make sure um, are covered going forward. I think that the report from the shelter management team tonight helped to address how a lot of those things are already happening. And I think that that's fantastic, has really helped to fill out our picture of things. Um, so I have a document here that I've uh, circulated to folks mere minutes before the meeting <laughs> and uh, is, is on your desks, is also available at the back table. And I'm not sure if it made the web or not, but probably not, but it will be there tomorrow. Um, and so uh, in, on the first page of that document, I just kind of gave my thoughts on each of those different areas. And then on the second page, I recommend a structure for dealing with that. A lot of what I have recommended here is um, reflective of what Ms. Stein was recommending at the last meeting uh, and also incorporates the details of Ms. Brewer's draft charge when she first proposed uh, a, a, a change to committee structure. And I'll, without going through the whole memo, I'll say that um, I think each of those seven points kinds of falls into two different areas. One of them is a committee that's dealing with sheltering and housing. And that was kind of the original proposal that, that we're still kind of fleshing out and, and seeing if that's what we're interested in. But um, points, what do I say here? Points three, four, five, <laughs> six, and seven, <laughs> most of the points all fit into that. Focusing on assuring future emergency shelter well needed, focus on securing permanent shelter, focus on permanent housing, focus on transitional support necessary for successful permanent housing, and focus on regional efforts and how Amherst fits into that. Those are all part of kind of the spectrum of sheltering and housing issues. Um, I would suggest that those would fit very nicely with the other housing issues that are part of the affordability spectrum that we've been talking about, things that are currently dealt with by our Housing Partnership Fair Housing Committee, um, and things that we're not really dealing with adequately at this point at all. Um, so I think that those things f really kind of work well together. We've also talked about the other points, which are points one and two, um, the review and feedback of the shelter RFP and the mechanism for continued collection and processing of feedback on shelter operations. To that, I propose uh, a shelter resource group. This is a little bit less formal than what Ms. Stein's original recommendation had been, but I'm wondering how she and all of us feel about that in the wake of all of the things that we learned tonight and from uh, Mr. Zomek's memo, and some of us have have known more about this because we're kind of closer to it than others um, already. But I think that Mr. Zomek and the team would benefit from having other perspective, other feedback, other eyes to be dealing with certain situations. And I think that to have a structure to give him and them that resource is, is valuable and important. I don't think it necessarily needs to be as formal as a committee that meets on a regular basis. I think it could be something that meets as necessary to assist him with discrete issues, such as the RFP uh, review, or RFQ, I'm sorry, we're calling it, uh, the RFQ that went out previously. Ms. Brewer and Ms. Stein met with Mr. Musanti and him uh, and Mr. Zomek and um, two members of the Committee on Homelessness to go over you know, kind of just some give and take about that. And, and all reports are that the document was better for that. Um, additionally, things could come up during the year that are something that, uh, th that he might need, the shelter team might need some more expertise or just more eyes to look at and consider. Um, so I think that having a shelter resource group to be another bit of oversight is extremely valuable. I just don't think it necessarily needs to be a new committee. I don't think we need to replicate that structure. I think that we have our bases covered very well. Um, so the other point that I put in there um, no, that covers all the points in there. So I'll just put that on the table for now. Ms. Stein. Um, I'd like to uh, say I agree with the basic 
structure that you put out. However, I do think there is value for a more formal um, shelter resource group. Uh, I think it should be more open to the public so that when there are issues, they c I don't think it has to meet like every week or every second week or every third week. Um, I think my original proposal was for once a month, but it wouldn't even have to be that often. I think, however, um, meeting in a way that's transparent would, I think, bring um, to the public the fact that we are dealing with problems as they come up and um, be reassuring to the public in general. So I, I would um, not necessarily stick to the format that I had, but the idea of a more permanent committee. And I think this committee uh, should be staff and select board and um, maybe a representative from the CDBG uh, fair housing um, committees as well, if, if that's a format that agrees with everyone. Thank you. Um, Ms. Brewer and then we'll go to the other side. Um, not having seen what Ms. O'Keefe was going to propose until, as she stated, very late. I'm sorry, but we need, we, we can't hear each other. Thank you. Um, having not, because um, Ms. O'Keefe has had a lot of other things to do this week, um, so I really appreciate the way you looked at this because, um, you know, previously we'd had my piece, Ms. Stein's piece and this piece. And... Okay. All right. Well, good. We'll work Thank on that you. too. Um, does this help at all? Yes. We're now amplified within the room, so okay. the mics are very important. All right. So, I remain unconvinced by Ms. Stein's previous proposal and what she has just reiterated here, despite the fact that we normally get along on everything associated with committee appointments. Um, I think that perhaps because some might perceive I'm too close to the issue, I don't think she's been as close as, as she could be, given that what I think we're lacking understanding here is that the transparency that you're looking for is not possible given the nature of the issues that people have at the shelter. The discussions that take place between the fire, de uh, between the police department and um, the town manager's office, Mr. Zomek, um, about how to deal with particular issues are, it, if they're not just the hours of the church, which we already know the answer to, that would be nice to talk about in public, except we've already done it. Um, if it's anything in regards to managing any type of behaviors or any difficulties, that's going to become easily personally identifiable really quickly. So I'm concerned about, I don't want another body that's similar to our um, semi-secret parking commission, which is <laughs> not something, something I constantly complain about. Um, I also don't want a body that can't actually have a substantive conversation because they can't talk about things too personally. And I have not yet seen, based on the types of issues that I've seen and the types of feedback that we've gotten from all the different letters, and for those of you out in the public who are concerned about the amount of public comment we had, we get constant letters and emails about this, all of which are available in the office. Um, and online mostly. And online mostly. Is that I'm not seeing what could be dealt with in that venue that would somehow convince the public that we're actually doing something. There have been many statements made that there was no town oversight. Well, that was absolutely not a fact. It, there was town oversight. Maybe we could communicate that there's oversight more, you know, more effectively. We've not been known to use press releases a lot, et cetera. But I'm not convinced there actually is a place for anybody off the street to come in and say, you know, I saw this letter to the editor that a person was really concerned about a thing they heard happened at the homeless shelter. How are you dealing with that? That's not a public meeting subject. That's something to be talked about with an individual. So I guess I'm still not seeing what the content of that would be. And since I don't see that, I'm seeing these other things as being, oh, okay, so if you had a question about the interface between the shelter operator, which is who we're actually hiring, and 
some of the bodies that come in to work with them. I believe Elliott Home Services was one of them, possibly Center for Human Development, it's Elliott Home Services for sure. And that interaction and how that works between like Elliott Home Services and in last year's case, Milestone Ministries and First Baptist. But again, those seem like management issues between those three bodies as opposed to the public needing to be at a meeting to discuss that rather than the public saying, hey, I'm concerned about this, go look into that, and expecting Mr. Zomack or someone else to go look into it. So I'm just not, s I'm not feeling what they'd accomplish. Okay, I'm actually gonna go over here first, we'll get a little bit more feedback and then y you can respond because it might all um, work together. Uh, Mr. Wall had his hand up. Yeah, thank you. I mean, as I've said before, I think I'm still really have an open mind about this. I'm trying to figure out where I stand because there's a lot of expert knowledge from the select board, from town staff, from the Homelessness Committee, uh, who all have different perspectives and dis different expertise. And I think what Ms. Stein and Ms. Brewer have said helps to answer some of my questions. The proposal that we just received from you today is also very useful because I think we're moving toward a kind of a consensus that some kind of consolidation is useful. I don't want to speak for others necessarily, but that some combination of services make, oversight of services makes sense as proposed here in the Sheltering and Housing Issues Committee, whatever we call it. But at the same time, there's been a very strong public sentiment, which I hear from the Homelessness Committee and from its friends and supporters in the community, that they feel some kind of special body dedicated to oversight or whatever you want to call it, engagement with the shelter <coughs> is also valuable. I mean, the fact that something is popular doesn't make it justified. The fact that it's not doesn't. But that's, that's a fact of life we should deal with. There's a public perception that some kind of engagement with the shelter should take place at a government level in a distinguishable way from other committee and service activity. So the question is how, and I guess what I, I liked what Ms. O'Keefe said here, uh, as she has in other contexts, that we should focus on the how, or the what, rather than the how. In other words, I got our main, can all of us come here, you know, no one is here with bad will or lack of sensitivity. We're all here because we care about the homelessness problem, because we care about social justice, because we care about hunger. We want to protect people and make our citizens welcome and safe. That's that's not a matter of debate. So I guess my question would always be, what of the specific proposal advances those goals? What might not advance them? And which ones don't really make a difference? Uh, in, I mean, the latter in a neutral sense. So for example, if we have the shelter resource group, I guess my question would be, and we've been getting at the beginning of an answer, you know, well, what would be the harm in making it a committee? Obviously, there's no sense in making committees for the sake of making committees, so I'd like to know what concrete things it would achieve. And Ms. Stein has suggested transparency and so forth. Ms. Brewer, who knows these things also better than I do, suggests that's not the case, but to me, that's a kind of a fruitful discussion to have. Uh, I'm not saying make a committee to make people happy, but I'm saying what, you know, what is the best form to get the job done? Uh, apropos of that, I'm the liaison to the Town Commercial Relations Committee, which I haven't visited in a while, but I keep in touch with people and hear what's going on. That's a committee that was brought into being also for a fairly particular need, uh, as I understand it from conversations with the members and what else I hear. Uh, they weren't quite sure they needed to continue at this point. Their decision was to, they wanted to remain in existence, but perhaps not meet regularly so they could be called upon as necessary. And I guess that's, the, that's one of the questions I would want to have going forward here with regard to Ms. O'Keefe's proposal and Ms. Stein's and Ms. Brewer's comments, what would be the, really the pros and cons of a resource group versus a committee? Is there something that one could do, the other couldn't? Maybe I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Mr. Hayden, did you have your hand up? Oh, I, I do, but I, I, is that gonna be continued? I, I have, I have um, um, a half-formed thought, but I, I want to um, keep clear, I'm looking at these two groups as to, for instance, with the shelter resource group, um, what resources are we talking about? I think it's important that we keep in mind that the resources that we, the select board and town meeting ultimately talk about are the resources that the town has to bring to this. Um, one of the things that struck me about Milestone Ministries report um, was actually uh, 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 Reverend Gates' um, tag on as to the number of um, institutions that I had never heard about who were involved that he had engaged in resolving the issues around um, his one shelter amongst the dozens of shelters that are in the western part of the state here. Um, you know, resources that include uh, a, alumna from Amherst College 
as well as any number of agencies all around. Um, so, you know, I think we need to be a little bit careful that we can say a shelter resource group is nice, but um, the resources that I think we need to be responsible for are the resources that we can be responsible for and that we are indeed as part of our elected duties. Um, the, the sheltering issue, um, I'm just going to toss a, an idea out there again, thinking out loud. This is kind of fun. We don't often get to do this. Um, the, um, what the resource that we might bring to the issue of permanent temporary shelter, temporary permanent shelter, whatever, whatever that concept is, the ESRO, the SRO, the, a place where a permanent place that anybody can come at any time when they need to get in out of the bad weather. The resource that we might bring to that is um, knowledge on the ground. Um, I think it would be really valuable for um, a group um, with the seal of approval of, let's say, the select board, maybe town meeting, to um, go out there and look for the facility, the resources that could be developed um, as a permanent place for um, emergency sheltering. Um, because there are a lot of resources we can bring to that. We can bring the CDBG money, we can bring um, CPAC money, we can bring, if it's infrastructure, state monies that support um, um, infrastructure improvements. Um, so I think that would be an important part for your first idea here. Have I gone past my time limit? The second thing that I would add to that um, is um, I would suggest that we make part of the committee that deals with sheltering and housing issues charge. Um, um, and, and I don't know monitoring twice a season or every week or whatever, but uh, I would be happy for them to, in some well-described way, um, report back to us, us, report back to the select board, um, what they see is going well and what they see might, we might improve in, in our next contract with the shelter provider. Okay. I'm gonna go back to Ms. Stein now. First, I wanna just make sure, are folks able to hear us? You're hearing us better? <laughs> okay, I'm not taking public comment right now. I'm just making sure you can hear us. Okay, Ms. Stein. Um, first of all, in, in the um, document that you drafted, you talk about, uh, uh, let me find where it said this, to review data and reports at the end of the shelter season. One of the, I thought Milestone Ministries did a wonderful job. I was not uh, totally thrilled by their final report, however. One of the advantages of having a group that meets and asks for in specific information during the course of the year, maybe four times only, I don't know, um, is that you can see what's missing what else should we ask for? So that's not privacy issues, that's general management plan. How is it being put into effect? How could it be changed? How could it be bettered? Um, I do think there are, um, it, it would be helpful to have a group who has a face, which has a face that the public could recognize. Also to come and say, I have a concern about this that I saw while I was volunteering. I just don't think the volunteers should be running the show. So. Um, all right. So Mr. Wald uh, uh, kind of focused the question nicely on pros and cons of a committee um, versus not being a real committee. And so um, let me separate these two issues for the moment. First of all, I'll say, okay, are we, are we feeling pretty good about the idea of a, certainly a formal committee that's dealing with sheltering and housing issues? Never mind if the details are exactly what, what I've put in here. We would continue to work on the charge and really clarify what we would want that committee to do. But are we feeling pretty good about that concept of, uh, of a formal committee that's dealing with sheltering and housing? 
people yes. are generally nodding and saying yes. Anybody say no? Okay. <laughs> All right. So so we can we can sort of put that to the side for the moment and and then deal with the other question. So then the other question is this this oversight um, and and resource potential. Um, so we talked about the pros and cons. Uh, or we talked about talking about the pros and cons of being a committee versus not a committee. Um, Ms. Brewer identified some good issues about privacy, et cetera. Um, I would say that I think it's very important that we don't create another oversight structure that's getting in the way. Part of what Milestone told us is, you know, you have to sort of let this ship sail, you know, once we've kind of created it and not get in the way. So I don't want to, considering the experience of last year and kind of how the press of that all went, I wouldn't want to scare anybody else away that we're creating yet another kind of shadow structure to deal with it. But I also hear what folks are saying about um, it is good to have this, this group have a face, to, to be identifiable that, all right, you are a representative from this group, and that there certainly are issues that you might want to talk about that, that lend themselves to a public meeting. And in fact, that could be a resource for the resource group, as some things are, are very, um, you, you really want and need that kind of public input and that kind of a forum. So now I'm kind of thinking, what if we merge these concepts? So what if we have <laughs> this shelter resource group? Maybe, as Ms. Stein suggested, it meets several times a year. But then, and, and it deals with in public issues of public, um, her point about kind of how are things doing, what do we, what do we want to make sure we get more of in a report next time, um, always going through, you know, staff kind of managing this. Um, I, I think that has a lot of value. But maybe these people would also be available for the non-public meetings to Mr. Zomek and the shelter management team, such that, you know, it's time to do the RFP. Well, you know, you might have certain individuals who are on that shelter resource group who would bring particular skills and talents to that. Maybe you're having a particular problem with a guest, a recurring guest that becomes a town issue. Well, you might have certain people on that resource group who could particularly help uh, the, the shelter management team to deal with that particular, that wouldn't be in a public meeting, that would just be kind of the pool of, of people who are available to, um, to give you feedback and assistance on an ongoing basis when you need it, if you need it. Um, how are people feeling about that concept? That this would be sort of a, a hybrid, that it would be, it would have names attached to it, but it wouldn't meet really very often, it would meet a couple of times with some specific concepts, and then it would be available, and, and then, don't worry, I'm going to ask for Mr. Zomek's <laughs> thoughts on <laughs> this. <laughs> so you're giving me what? Um, so so we'll let's just kind of play with that idea for a minute and see where it gets us. Ms. Brewer. Um, one of the thoughts that had occurred to me in addition to complaining about my favorite pet peeve, the parking group, is that it actually would be more, could be, under what we're talking about, more like the Water Supply Protection Committee from the standpoint that that's not a group that meets every month. That's a group that meet that is a known group of experts that are resources when something comes up that needs to be dealt with beyond our usual expert town staff, you know, people with more information on the ground. And one of the things that popped into my head when you know looking at your layout here of the shelter resource group was certainly, for example, one of the discussions a number of us had associated with this year's RFP was how to address the issue of services that were being provided and the qualifications of the people providing them because we didn't want to get into a situation where we made a contract with a provider who was going to give what we felt would be lesser services than what we've already offered in the past. You know, we always want to improve, certainly offer at least the same level of services, not something worse. We wanted to make sure we could kind of define that because we didn't know who would apply. And what would have been helpful if we'd been able to get the timing right was to talk more with, for example, Elliott Home Services, which had done various service provision at the shelter to say, okay, given what we're trying to get to, what are the right words to use? And you know, we even made a mistake earlier in the, in the RFP saying license to work with the homeless, which is not a real concept, but it, it was trying to express what we were trying to get to. So when you have that group of experts, like the water supply people, you don't make mistakes like that because you know, oh, I can just go ask. I think the one of the things that I was trying very hard to avoid was a group that felt like, 
okay, this year we get to decide what's in the RFP. Rather, it's, you know, all the information we have and we still go through the normal process of doing bids, RFPs, RFQs, whatever we end up calling them in any particular <coughs> circumstance, which is largely town staff. And that it would be perfectly fine and everyone would understand it was perfectly fine to, you know, have meetings, whether it's quarterly or however, obviously be a little, it would be affected by the shelter season itself. And then also it would be perfectly fine for staff to say, I want to hear some more from somebody in the Western Mass Regional Network about how we might incorporate X, or I want to call so and so, and they should not feel pressured that they have to have the whole committee weigh in on everything. That's what I'm trying to avoid, and that they can continue to exhibit their person, their professional judgment in terms of who to look to, and we can kind of continue to accumulate resources for them, but that this group would not necessarily, therefore, get to be part of every single conversation. I think we're getting to sort of the same place here. Were there comments over here? Yeah, you went first. I'll wait. Just very briefly, um, as, as this begins to develop, um, I sort of wanna, I want us, I want us to keep in mind, I'm certainly gonna keep in mind that the object is um, at the very bottom, sort of, you know, the, the last thing that happens before the shelter opens is that a contract is signed. And um, we need to be sure that that contract can be effectively um, uh, observed, adhered to, um, that it is, that it covers what we need to. And I think the, uh, the idea of the Watershed Protection Committee is, is a, a very interesting one. Um, but at the end, um, we are going to be put a lot of money on the line um, probably twice as much as we actually pay, and we learned how much more expensive it is than we actually end up paying. But, um, and we're putting a lot of people's um, um, professional, um, uh, professional lives on the line. These people who provide these services, um, you know, have to abide by all kinds of rules and um, I just want us to be clear that what we're aiming for is an effective contract, one that provides the services that we need and describes what those services are well enough to people who can provide them so that um, they can be provided effectively. Yeah. Right, and that we don't make this so onerous that nobody wants to work with the town and Cameron. Well, that's the other so side. I mean, it's not yeah. an effective contract if nobody wants to enter into it. Okay, so I'm gonna go with Mr. Wild and then Mr. Zomack, you can sort of think about what kind of feedback you have on what we're talking about here. I'll pass. Okay. <laughs> are you ready or you want me to? <laughs> go to sure. a <coughs> well, um, I haven't had um, time to really absorb this because I'm seeing it for the first time. Um, I would agree with, with the, the um, connections made to the water supply protection group. I, I think that's a, a, a good analogy. Um, I like the idea of, of you know having this resource group uh, give input on things like the RFP or RFQ, um, providing some sort of uh, more feedback loop, um, review of reports, uh, review of, of um, they're now monthly reports. Uh, that was one of the changes we made that they're due the, the first week, the first week in every month so that we don't have a long period of time going by before we get those re uh, reports. Um, my primary concern would be issues of privacy that we don't get into, and it's, as, as Ms. Brewer pointed out, it's very easy, and you very quickly get into specific issues with specific guests, and that's not an area for a group like this or a committee. Um, frankly, it's an area where um, uh, staff, uh, we need to leave that to the professionals, some of whom we have here uh, representing town staff and others at Milestone Ministries and um, in, in the past year and uh, Elliott uh, Services, for instance. Um, the other, yeah, so the main issue is, is, is privacy and then letting the social service agencies and those providers do their work. They're the experts. I am not an expert on those social service issues that and, and the, the incredible skills and experience they bring. And we, we need to 
step aside and, and let them do the good work that they do. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Stein. I think that's absolutely right, but I think those parts of the reports that can be shared on a monthly basis, it doesn't have to be that this committee meets every month. We could we speak a little bit louder. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm Thank sorry. You. What I'm saying is that I understand the privacy issues and that certain problems can't be aired in public because they would unwittingly identify a client or a pa um, um, participant in the shelter. But I do think that a uh, large part probably of those monthly reports, and as I said, the, m the committee wouldn't have to meet every month. Um, it could meet every two months to review those reports and see if we're getting the kinds of information we would want um, or if things could be modified in some way to improve them. I don't think we want to wait to the end and I do think there are issues that could be raised that don't tread on privacy. I agree. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Walton. Uh, in, in a similar vein, I guess I wasn't thinking of the charge having to do so much with those kind of privacy issues, though they're important, and I don't know if we need to clarify that further. Uh, I would assume, for example, also there must be some, I mean, somebody's overseeing something all the time in different ways, so I assume there are ways for people to raise issues, whether it's about the behavior of the shelter management or the shelter guests that need not involve this committee or this committee in its entirety in public session. So I don't know if Mr. Zomek or could clarify that, but it seemed to me, in other words, there's, there's enough here to do without, without getting into that, and those could be addressed by other means. Is that reasonable? That's my hope. That's reasonable, yes. So uh, going back to this uh, uh, analogy of the Water Supply Protection Committee, I, I agree that's a very strong analogy to use for what the structure would look like. So this is a committee that meets as necessary. So it could meet a little more formally than Water Supply Protection Committee that doesn't meet on a regular basis. But, you know, that could be, you know, to be determined. But also that is an, an identified town uh, recognized collection of people who are interested in and knowledgeable about the subject that Mr. Mooring or Mr. Musanti can go to when there are questions or issues if they arrive, uh, arise during the year. They don't necessarily have to call a meeting of the whole committee. They might call in two people and say, listen, you know, I, I want to bounce this around with you. Um, so I, I think that, I think that this committee could work, this, this resource group could work that way also. It, it would be a committee that meets a certain amount of time um, to address certain issues, but then is otherwise available as a resource. You're going to have to be quiet if you're going to stay in the room. Thank you. Um, the, that would be available to uh, town staff as needed. We don't know when it would be needed, but we're just saying here, this is, this is an option to help you. Okay. Um, other thoughts on where we are? Are we sort of it seems like we're kind of on the same page. Did we answer your question, Mr. Wall? Okay. All right, Ms. Brewer. I'm probably going to push you further along than you necessarily <laughs> wanted to be at this point, but given where we are uh, time-wise and given where we are in the year with the shelter and also with other issues um, associated with this body and the current Housing Partnership for Housing Committee, I'm wondering um, what our various options are in terms of forward progress, knowing that, for example, most committee members on most of those committees have terms have expired, but we've asked them to continue to serve till we figured out what we were doing, and they're legally able to do that. But there's also the question of how long they should continue to meet with their current charges, given that we know we're moving in another direction. So just trying to sort out the logical parts. So. So I think that we are coalescing around this concept, that we have a, a formal committee that meets regularly and will have a, a very comprehensive charge and um, that we would be looking for real experts to assist us with that will be dealing with um, the, the range of sheltering and housing issues. And that we are looking at this shelter resource group that would meet formally on some to be determined schedule, but then be a resource going forward um, during the year for uh, town staff, and that we have moved away from the concept of the Committee on Homelessness and the Housing Partnership as they currently exist. Do we agree? Mr. Walt. Not agreeing or disagreeing, but what would be the mechanism for creating such a resource group? Uh, 
would we create it? Would it look like a committee in all but name? In other words, would it have appointments and terms and everything else? But since we've just been working with in such detail, thanks to Ms. Stein on the committee handbook, it might be an interesting issue to, to consider. <laughs> Yes, and I think that we don't need to get bogged down on those details necessarily tonight. We can keep looking at, you know, the, we can keep clarifying, getting more specific about the structure uh, and the charges of both of these groups. Um, but I think it would be a formal committee. I think it would, going back to water supply <laughs> protection as, as our good analogy, you know, um, that, um, that I, and, and I think like the water supply pr protection group, we would be looking for people to fill really certain roles on that. Um, so. Okay, so we'll keep clarifying that. Okay, so uh, to Ms. Brewer's point, I there is a lot of um, uncertainty about the other committees as they currently exist, and I think that we owe it to the committees because we seem to be at a point of not being uncertain about how we're looking to proceed from here to be, um, to be definitive about this. Um, I would like to state for folks who are concerned, I feel very strongly that this does not represent the town moving away from its commitment to homeless people and their needs. I think that this is an evolution and a real uh, progress step on how we better as a town um, uh, try to meet those needs. So, uh, so for folks who are concerned that getting rid of the Committee on Homelessness is, uh, is uh, stepping back from our commitment, I, I see that as quite the opposite. Um, so then, uh, it's only to make a motion then to dissolve the current committees as they exist and to proceed with the uh, structure that we've talked about tonight. So moved. For a uh, second. Second. Thank you. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. I'm sorry, was I'm there further discussion? Okay. Um, we should say for discussion then, um, this would be effective essentially immediately and we would be looking to move forward with these new um, committee charges and clarifications as quickly as possible. Exactly, and, and again, I mean, this is clar to clarify yet again and there are going to be people who don't accept this, but the reality is, yes, this is an evolution. Just as we had an emergency homelessness task force when we realized, wow, we really need to do something here in Amherst. And then we moved into having a committee on homelessness and now we're moving into this model that's not moving away. Even if we didn't populate either one of these committees, we'd still sign a contract for the shelter season. That would still happen with the town staff even if there were no committees associated with this. So I wanna make sure that's really clear to people that we are not leaving anything behind. And in terms of uh, timing issues, it actually seems to be a relatively good time to do this in, given that there has been input to the RFQ. The contract is much more of a formality and negotiation between town staff and possible providers. And it's not you know, super heavy CPAC time or block grant time or anything like that. So I don't think we're messing anybody up by doing it this way either. Okay, further discussion. Mr. Hayden. Yeah, just very briefly to go back to an idea that I brought up earlier. I mean, this is our next experiment. And so what I would tell our viewers and everybody in the audience is, is, is watch this space, because whether or not you believe that um, we are in earnest about helping people without homes get to shelter and be safe, um, you can watch our actions and see that it's so. Thank you, and like all things, we, we try and improve them and make them better as time goes on, and that's what we're doing. So, all in favor, say aye. 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 And opposed, abstaining. That was unanimous, is that correct? Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, and uh, give our heartfelt thanks to all the folks who have served on these committees through the years, and uh, we appreciate your continued involvement and all your commentary. That's absolutely right, and, and your advocacy on behalf of the homeless should continue. It's just no longer officially a town committee. Thank you very much, and we appreciate your coming tonight. I'm sorry, ma'am. I understand that you're disappointed, and we appreciate your feedback and your coming in. Thank you very much. All right, moving along. Whoops. Next on the agenda is we have the t acting town manager's report, Mr. Zomek. 
Uh, thank you. I'll try to be brief given the, uh, the hour. Um, I think as most of you know, you may have received a, a, a press release from the town manager's office today reporting that um, Mr. Musanti is um, re recuperating at home. We're very thankful that he is now at home and has um, returned from uh, Bay State and uh, we wish him the very best and uh, everyone in town hall and I think in the town of Amherst are sending positive uh, wishes uh, for recovery his way. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, Ms. O'Keefe. Um, I will with this opportunity. Um, we went through an extraordinary situation last week and um, I just want to say how well the town, town staff, town hall responded to that. I thank Mr. Zomak very much for being willing and able to step up and fill a very big role on extremely short notice in really difficult circumstances. Um, I thank very much the chief of police who has been extraordinary in, in keeping me informed and keeping uh, Mr. Zomak informed. I thank Deborah Roussel, who is the assistant to the town manager, who has just stepped up and known what we needed to do to uh, kind of keep all of this going. Um, this, was a, this was a big void to fill suddenly and for all the various emergency management type plans that we do, this isn't really the kind of emergency that we plan for. Uh, and I have just been incredibly impressed by how folks have handled this and managed this. Uh, it is a tribute to the team that uh, Mr. Musanti has put together and a tribute to just town staff in general and how well they work together, how truly committed they are to the town and it has just been um, just e extraordinary to watch and I thank Mr. Zomek and, and the rest very much. Thank you. Uh, let me continue and run through a couple of quick updates for the board and the public. Um, I did want to announce that uh, the DPW has um, instituted a temporary road closing. This is in support of the extensive road work being, up, um, being completed as part of the Atkins Village Center project. Uh, Country Corners Road at 116. I think everyone is familiar with the, the construction that's going on uh, down uh, near the uh, Atkins. And so from September 12th today through September 30th, um, the east end of Country Corners Road will be blocked off. And this is really uh, an effort to try to uh, um, uh, get in a little bit more control some of the, uh, the traffic uh, issues that uh, we were faced with uh, during the last couple of weeks down uh, in the Atkins Village corner. Um, so that is September 12th through 30th. I will say that Mr. Mooring um, has, has done a great job in reaching out to the community there in the last couple of weeks and, and some of the neighbors and residents. And uh, this seems to be a, a solution that is supported by um, um, people who live in that neighborhood. If you don't mind, I'll just add a little bit more to that also. Poor Mr. Zomak hasn't dealt with the select board meeting before. Um, uh, you just have to sort of punch me every so often when I uh, get in your way. Um, this is a great example of public feedback uh, helping us to correct a problem. We were getting a lot of feedback on this. The Public Works Committee uh, was dealing with it. Mr. Mooring was dealing with it. Um, this was a, a an unexpected, well, in some ways it was expected, but considering certain circumstances that occurred, this was unexpected for exactly how this happened. And um, and this, this solution is a great way uh, to address. It was brought from the folks on those roads who were so affected, and this is a, a great way to address their concerns as part of what, um, a, a necessary construction detour. This is an extraordinary project that's happening in South Amherst, and this is uh, and it requires uh, a different sort of a response. And so, um, to anybody who's concerned that you know just because neighbors complain about traffic. Uh, you know, then we shut down the street or whatever. Folks who watch a lot of select board meetings know that actually we don't do that. <laughs> and uh, in a meeting with Mr. Zomek and Mr. Mooring, we talked about whether this needed to be a select board issue, but actually realized that this is much more appropriately a DPW issue and that that gives greater flexibility to them to be able to open and close that road as necessary and uh, make adjustments as opposed to making it a select board issue, which would then actually establish a significant precedent. So, um, so thanks very much to all the folks who were involved in giving us the feedback that this needed to happen and in the folk to the folks who helped make it happen. Ms. Brewer, question about that? And, and I imagine you probably already had this conversation, but speaking as someone who was not involved at all in any of the conversations beyond just getting the angry emails, is 
that I think we still have a little room for improvement on how people can tell us things before they get to the really panicked and upset stage. Um, of course, some people are immediately that their reaction, but there seemed to be a building associated, um, a building concern associated with this that we, although we can't personally do anything about it as a select board, we weren't particularly aware of as being an issue. And I just wonder if there's a way we can clarify as these conti conversations continue to take place, what's a good way for people to be able to say, hey, you know that project down at Atkins? I'm worried that this isn't quite going the way I thought it was going to go. If they can say it that way early and who they should say that to because I think some people felt like they must have talked to the wrong people and now they weren't getting their concerns heard and of course it all worked out in the end but in the medium term if we've never really figured out that whole suggestion box concern thing and I'm not sure if we've thought of another way to maybe approach that. Um, I, so I think that folks were directing their concerns very appropriately. The, the discussion about the traffic, the increased traffic that this whole project would lead to in that area has been happening for a long time. Then right. things really came to a head yeah. under, under peculiar circumstances, which is that the uh, road work has been progressing much faster than expected, and that meant that they suddenly needed to make a detour, an official detour through this area that had always been promised would never happen. Well, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. And once that happened, that's when things really got to be messy. And so this is a state project. It has to do with communication right. with the town and whatever. We're learning from it and going forward. But, uh, but this one is a little bit unusual as far as trying to model as, as how we make it better going forward because it's, it's weird. Hopefully there'll never be another one right. exactly, exactly like it. <laughs> but in terms of if there, yep. if there are concerns, if people do in general just have these concerns, what, who's their best? Initial contact. If, if it's about traffic issues, select board and or DPW. Right, because there's a know. separate traffic section basically on the DPW website. So mm -hmm. everybody do that. Okay, other questions or comments about this, Mr. Hayden? Yeah, I just add one more, um, not a detail, but sort of a sidelight on, on, um, on, on what happened. That there was actually um, um, a remedy that was attempted to you know, get the detour to go someplace else besides uh, th through the neighborhood. Uh, which didn't work. So I think, you know, certainly the Public Works Committee learned from that as well. So there's a lot of stuff that went, that we learned because, which is a good thing. Sorry about all the traffic and the accident that was sort of amazing um, in the neighborhood. And thank you, Mr. Zomer. I'm moving forward. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe the, the board is aware of the Mass Works uh, grant uh, deadline upcoming. It was extended from um, I believe the 9th of September to the 16th. Uh, Mr. Mooring, Mr. Tucker, Mr. Malloy, and other staff are, are working very diligently to try to meet that uh, 916 deadline. Um, this grant will focus on um, waterline improvements and other improvements to Pine Street to support our efforts on improvements to the North Amherst Village Center. Um, again, I, I think it'll be a, a fairly sizable um, uh, grant request and we're working on those details now and in the next couple of days. Thank you. Questions or comments about that? Moving right along. CDBG process, um, I believe um, uh, thanks in large part to Mr. Malloy and Mr. Rosenblatt and others, uh, the, the CDBG process is very well outlined on the, on the town website. Proposals are due on 9-15 later on this week. Um, at that point, staff will, as we did last year, scan them, and so they will be available to the public for viewing on the website. I think that was very well received last year, and we'll be doing it again uh, this year. On 9-20, the CDBG Advisory Committee uh, meets for their public hearing, and presentations will take place. Um, as you know, these will be for both capital and social service uh, uh, projects. And then on 9-22, there's a public meeting and discussion, at which time the, the uh, CDBG Advisory Committee will uh, fully discuss each proposal, ask follow-up questions, and then the expectation, and, and this, this latter part of the, of the process is a little bit fluid, but recommendations to the town manager would be expected sometime in mid-October. Um, and there's some flexibility there, and, and it's really up to the, to the Advisory Committee as to how they move that piece forward. Um, again, we're expecting a very robust response, both on the capital side and the social service side of, uh, of our CDBG um, um, period. Thank you. Questions about that, Ms. Brewer? 
I frankly don't have any idea how either you or Mr. Zomack are keeping your heads around all the different things that have been happening this past week, in addition to your usual stuff. But while I have one piece of information that people may have heard something about, I know people had expressed concern, um, obviously due to the federal budget situation, that we might lose money as a mini entitlement mm -hmm. community, uh, community, just as some other communities had. You know, Northampton gets their money directly from the feds, and they knew they were going to get a cut. We get ours through the state. We, it was, seemed like we were okay. We weren't quite sure. Well, we aren't. We now have $900,000 total instead of a million total. So it doesn't change what we've already done, but it does change going into that hearing. That just means there's that much less money to go around. And unfortunately, we have to apportion that cut of $100,000 to all three areas, capital, social services, and administrative. We can't just take it all out of one, for example. So that leaves our social service agencies who have been you know, competing when they can only have, we can only have five of them anyway as a mental entitlement community. Now they're competing for less. Plus, we're spending more on the shelter because we knew we needed to. It's probably still not enough, but we know we need to put in the $101,000 to that. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a real struggle. So I guess a heads up <laughs> for that the social service agencies are aware of this. Of course, they're well on top of it, but we'll probably be hearing more concerns expressed by them that they're very frustrated that they can't get the funding from us. Thank you. Any, <laughs> any other questions on CDBG? Um, let's see. Sheltering, um, just a quick follow-up. Um, as you're, most of you are aware, the RFQ deadline for sh the town sheltering um, proposals was Friday. Uh, at 3 p.m., we did receive one proposal. That was from an organization called Craig's Doors, which is a local nonprofit. Um, we will be, as per Mr. Musanti's uh, uh, directions to me some weeks ago, we will putting we will be putting together a, a small staff supported review committee. Um, likely, one or two members of the select board would would join that small group to um, review that proposal for completeness, uh, whether they have met all the requirements of the uh, RFQ, and uh, they would then make a, a recommendation to the town manager um, upon their review. So we hope to have that done within um, just a few days. Thank you. Ms. Brewer. I, I did want to make one clarification about Craig's Doors. I appreciate Mr. Zuma uh, mentioning that it's a local group. Although it was stated previously that um, there had been some discussion about support of an agency that had been serving someone well, Craig's Doors is a brand new agency. It has people in it who have served in other agencies and in other capacities. So it's one of these things that's come together with various people's experiences. But that agency hasn't served anybody yet. <laughs> it's a brand new thing that barely has, uh, we assume they have, their 501c3. So um, there are some various experiences they bring to it. But we, I just want to make sure it's clear, we can't call anybody for references on Craig's door because there aren't any. But there will be, of course, for, for the various individuals that make up the group. And so it would be an interesting proposal to look at. Thank you. Mr. Reed. Were there any near responses? One response is kind of pretty thin pickings. Uh, not that I'm aware of. It's not as puny as you'd think. We really actually don't usually get, I mean, when we did the warming shelter and when we did, and when we did the shelter last year, we usually only get two, one or two. It's not three something last time. that we get tons. We didn't have three to choose from though. We didn't have, oh. yeah. yeah. It didn't turn out to be three to choose from. So it's not like a lot of other things, like back when we did the master plan, we had five or six people that wanted right. to do it with us, yeah. There. Other questions or comments? Thank you, Mr. Zomack. No, thank you. Yeah. Okay, Sorry. then um, before we get to member reports, I want to make sure, Ms. Ms. this gentleman, are you here for Stavros or anything? So uh, I'm actually here for the new taxi driver license. Uh, I need her, um, I need her to get the taxi driver license. I see on the agenda that my name actually isn't there for some reason. 
Okay. Um, it should have been communicated to you that you didn't need to come in tonight. Um, first of all, if you're not on the agenda, then we're not actually going to approve your license anyway. Um, secondly, um, we don't make taxi driver applicants come in anymore. Once your paperwork gets completely dealt with um, upstairs and if it's recommended for approval by the police chief who does a background check and everything, then it comes to us and we just approve it. Um, but you don't need to come in. I apologize that you've been sitting here for however long you've been sitting here. And because our meetings are fascinating. I'm going to hold that uh, everything was all set. And they did tell me I didn't have to come in today. But uh, one of my hopefully future coworkers told me that a similar situation has happened to him. So it would be a good idea to come and mention it. Right. Uh, okay. I'm not sure how the process works for you guys. So if it's impossible to get approved today, um, I would like to ask how I would find out uh, how to go ahead and get this taken care of. Could you tell me what your name is? Uh, Christopher Lyons. Uh, and what company are you looking to drive for? Uh, it's going to be for Celebrity Cab. Okay. All right. I apologize that you're not on here right now. And unfortunately, we have no mechanism for dealing with that. But um, we will make sure that you're on the next agenda. And, and, and at that time, you don't need to come in. So we just, we just have to make sure we have the, the paperwork and recommendation to us. And I apologize that something slipped through the cracks. As you've probably heard we've had a bit of drama this past week with the town manager and the office and everything. So uh, we will double check on this and make sure somebody gets back to you. Okay. Thank you. I apologize. No problem. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So the taxi. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes these things do happen. Sorry. All right, uh, back to where I was. Whoops. Trying something different here, and it's not working for me. Okay, back to the agenda, where we have member reports. Um, confirm liaison assignments. Um, we had at the last meeting talked about our various liaison assignments, and Mr. Hayden wasn't here for that. And uh, while we did talk about assigning everything to you in your absence, we decided that would simply be mean, because um, then none of us would ever want to miss a meeting, so <laughs> that would be bad. Um, so at that time, we had essentially confirmed all of our, uh, keeping all of our assignments. Um, but in the meantime, um, Ms. Stein and Mr. Hayden have spoken, so if you want to talk about what, what you're looking to do now. Right. If you remember at that meeting, I asked if there was anybody who would be willing to take over the zoning subcommittee, <laughs> and while we couldn't um, give it to Aaron with in his absence, he has subsequently agreed that we could trade. Um, and so he will be taking over a zoning subcommittee for me, and we have notified the planning staff about that. And I will be taking over the Kanakasaki Sister City Committee from Mr. Hayden, and I have notified Nancy Pagano about that. So I think we're all set, except Well, except that I, I have a very large package that I need to deliver to you. <laughs> oh, okay. Little, little bedtime reading. Okay. Well, you don't want all the stuff from, <laughs> <laughs> from the zoning subcommittee, do you? I mean, I can give you packets and packets, but I think you will probably well, just start well, What I need, yes, I do want. I'm, I'm only giving you what you really should have from kind of okay. Kanakasaki. So. All right. We well, can coordinate I'll that part after. So yes. we just want to make sure we're talking about this meeting. So right. then the other th question was uh, design review board. Do I have that on here erroneously? Um, it, it, that was an error. Um, yeah, at I, the I time, like I was. My <laughs> yeah, I thought that Aaron was on it, and he and I were going to switch for that and he'd forgotten that Jim had taken that off. Yeah, I and mean the so reason we thought I was on it is because it says I'm on it. It right did, right it Jim it did say that. Um, is that right? I okay. Yeah. It's now been fixed. It's okay. It's a well-represented It board. has been fixed. <laughs> okay. So, um, so presumably since none of the other select board members wanted these assignments previously. Uh, oh, it hasn't been completely we're, uh, fixed. We're no, it hasn't. good with that. Okay, I Mr. Hayden. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry I missed the meeting because um, there is a blank on the list here that um, I <sighs> would like to fill. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the Recycling and Refuse Management Committee. Um, uh, typically, I, I think that that has not had a liaison just generally because their work is pretty self-contained, but um, they, they contacted me and uh, wondering how to go about getting a liaison because they do have a project coming up that um, might take more of our attention than 
the work usually does. This is the zero. Actually, I've got to be careful. They're, they're discussing whether they should call it the zero waste plan because you can't get to zero and you don't want to make it impossible for people to. Uh, but uh, they're looking at ways of reducing the waste stream um, and so would like our attention to that, which I would give. Okay, so that is currently a committee without a liaison. Does anybody have a problem with Mr. Hayden taking over that liaison trip? Excellent. Um, on that subject, Ms. Stein had, had a concept for uh, committees that don't have liaisons. Would you like to talk about that? I began to feel sorry for the list of committees um, that we cannot staff because we're already of um, liaison to so many. And I suggested that perhaps Ms. O'Keefe would write a letter on behalf of the select board to those committees saying that we're always available by email um, and even an occasional attendance if so needed to discuss any problems, issues, give any information that we could just so that they had some kind of a, of a contact with us. I've done that informally with the Cultural Council but I thought it might be nice for some of the others that have never heard from us to hear from us. Mm. Ms. Hayden. Um, and and this, the request coming to me from the, the, the recycling committee sort of brings to mind, uh, in our sort of an extension to our discussion about liaisons and what they do, um, I mean, they have a project, and the project really would, I imagine, benefit from the select board's attention. Uh, when the project is over, maybe I'll remain being liaison, but may not be as engaged. Um, that might be sort of an extension of what um, Ms. Stein is suggesting. Um, if any one of these other groups is needing some help, either with an issue that they're, with a you know, policy or plan that they're developing, or with a presentation to town meeting, or to the select board for that matter, you know, I certainly would expect you to get a letter making the request that somebody help them. I, I think that's a great idea to really kind of clarify things and say just because there isn't somebody assigned to your meeting, you know, we still are here as a resource for you. Right. Do you want to yeah, say and I would, I would add one other um, item to that resource list, and, and that might be organization. I mean, if the committee itself needs help, you know, establishing officers and policies, you know, just internal operating policies, um, we might help, we might be willing to help with that too. Um, not that I know of any committee that needs that help now, but I, I know that a couple of hints that I've given to some of my committees have helped a lot, mm -hmm. and I just happened to be there when something happened. Okay, Ms. Brewer. Um, I, I'm going to actually move away from Ms. Stein before I say this, but forgetting <laughs> what it says, <laughs> forgetting what it says in the committee appointed committee handbook about liaisons, <laughs> um, whatever it says, yeah, we should put in this letter which I'm thinking Mr. Hayden sounds like he really wants to write for Ms. O'Keefe to just sign <laughs> off on because he's got a lot of ideas for yeah. what should go in it. So I'm really thinking it would be a good idea for him to write it. But it, they need to match up because whatever, whatever, if we've got any reference to it whatsoever, people, I've actually heard of people like referring to this thing now. And so we want to make sure they're connected in some fashion so that, and, and obviously we'll continue to talk just as last week I, or when you weren't here, I said with Ms. Stein, I said, oh good, let's not send anybody to zoning subcommittee because then the planning board can't accuse us of micromanaging their process. Um, but now we're sending you, so. <laughs> I'm such a micromanager. And I know not that Ms. Stein been doing that either. under Ms. Stein. Not that we'd <laughs> ever do that. Okay, um, I, I think um, uh, you raise an interesting point, but I would um, be sure that whoever writes this letter would make it very clear that this would not be a formal liaison, um, but because we cannot possibly manage to provide a liaison for every committee. However, we would be a resource, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I think it, we're all kind of good with that concept. Yeah. Then. Okay, good. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, liaison representative reports. Come in. Where are we? Okay, you want to do that before tax advice? It's fine. Okay, that's fine. I'm sorry. Uh, liaison reports? Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Did, what did you say about taxi licenses? That's well, I was just it. wondering what you wanted to do next. That's oh. all. So are we, uh, I'm trying not to depart from the agenda. Are you thinking okay. that we're departing from the agenda? Uh, I guess I was, sorry. We're that's under right. member it reports, doesn't matter. second this bullet, is fine. liaison reports. Okay. okay. So um, I think we all went to the community breakfast, which was very nice, a little poignant as it was Holub's last one. 
and the first time without our band leader, uh, our former band leader. Um, September 1st, we attended, um, some of us attended, um, well, Stephanie and I attended the International Student Reception, um, and that was very lovely. It's always great to meet these um, wonderful people who come from all over the world to, to um, spend a year or more in Amherst. And that night, there was a first day celebration on the Common, and Stephanie and I were there, and Aaron was there. Mm -hmm. I, that's who I remember. The next day was in the morning at 8.30, and Alyssa was there, was a marvelous, absolutely marvelous presentation by our students. One of the best I have ever seen. There were about five of them speaking about what Amherst schools and particular teachers meant to them. And it left me with just the most glorious feeling about our schools. It was really terrific. Uh, we agree. Yeah, that was great. Uh, let's see, September 6th, um, went to, with a, again, a, uh, Stephanie, to a Zoning Board of Appeals administration discussion meeting, and there was very good dialogue amongst the members about their current practices and ways to increase efficiency. Um, September 8th was JC, this was very busy, as I had to write it all down. JCPC, uh, we had our introductory session and Jim Wald and I were there. Uh, we talked about a number of things, but particularly that um, our allocation last year to capital <coughs> was 6.45% of the tax levy, but that that's only approximately 3% of our total budget. And Mr. Pooler pointed out that that's sort of low compared to other communities, so our goal of raising it is, is a good one. Whether we can do it or not is another story. Um, and it's too early to um, project where we would be this year. Um, another point that uh, received a lot of attention during that meeting was the fact that some departments have um, not expended all the money that JCPC allocated to them. And um, although the departments do report to Sonia, in some cases, um, at least one that comes to mind, um, it's not been clear to JCPC that when a um, a uh, department comes and asks for money that they still have money in their pocket and why there sometimes can be good reasons for it because they need to get several years in a row of allocations to get enough for what they want to do. But in some cases, it almost seems like it's um, forgotten. So we are going to track that a little better this year. And that is the end of my reports. Mr. Wall, do you want to elaborate on JCPC? Add anything at all to that while we're on that subject? I think Ms. Stein has been pretty comprehensive. We also discussed committee structure, whether we have to have a formal chair and a vice chair and so forth. And I think with the JCPC, it's it's a little bit similar to some of the CPAC money. Some, you know, we should make clear it's not being wasted. It's not going away anywhere. No. It sits there. If it's expended, it's expended. If not, it either remains or can be returned to the account. So there was some sense that uh, in order to help these bodies, I think the Munson Library has something going back to 2002. You know, not, it's not always clear the right hand knows what the left hand is doing, so it seemed useful to take a look at it. But we also made made clear that we're not an oversight committee. We're simply trying to monitor things and to keep the information flowing properly. The main task is allocations, as Ms. Stein said, and, and the main goal is to raise the share of money to go to the capital because it's not where it should be. But that's a result of circumstances, obviously. Thank you. The general economy. While we're on you, do you want to add anything to any other ways or interest? I generally refrain from these things in the interest of time, but since we're having fun. Uh, I mentioned TCRC. I had been in touch to, uh, to follow up with the chair. Uh, th my understanding is they would like to remain in existence, but don't feel the need to meet as often or regularly. There will be some issues about committee charge or compos uh, composition, I should say. That's an old issue. Uh, public arts, is I, I wasn't able to attend because of my own schedule this last uh, two weeks, but they are getting ready for the art walk and gearing up for the usual things. We have, have some interesting conversations there about that. And as you saw, there were previous questions about clarifying, you know, who has control over what public spaces for what kinds of display, and we'll try to adjudicate those issues. That is, we in the select board will try to 
help clarify what the procedures are there. Uh, historical Commission, I should just mention the only thing that's of interest, general interest there, above and beyond the kind of things you've heard about with the cemetery and the commemorations, there was apparently a request for us to help out with some kind of restoration work for the county uh, town hall. And the committee decided, appropriately in my view, that that's not the way to go. These are based on local taxes, and we have our own issues and our own projects. And to try to commit to some kind of regional collaboration in that way is not the route we want to take right now. And I think those are the design review continues to review uh, signed proposals, new buildings, and so forth, but nothing dramatic I need to be put on in detail. Uh, Ms. Burr. Quickly, well, I'll try and be quick about it since you brought it up. And since we have gotten a letter as a select board as well, from ha it's from Hampshire Council of Governments, right, trying to preserve the building in downtown Northampton and thinking, oh, maybe we could use some CPAC money or something like that from individual communities. And of course, my immediate reaction was no. But um, so historical <laughs> commission's reaction has been the same thus far. <laughs> okay, that's good to know moving forward. Thank you. I, I'll just add a point of clarification. It's for the courthouse right, right. so that it does have some regional use, but even still, uh, we have such a limited number of funds and so many worthy projects that supporting it. Just and so that was specifically a CPAC recommendation, is that correct? As I understand, I was not present at the meeting. It was the first one since I stepped down as chair, so I'm letting them do their thing before I liaise with them in person. But this was for Mr. Malloy. Okay. Report. Okay. So I'm just wondering. Um, I can follow up with Mr. Malloy if you'd like, but uh, I'm just thinking about wh what happens going forward. Like, um, so we typically get a kind of a report on all the CPAC proposals that are recommended for funding, as well as information on those that were not recommended for funding, and so that would fall into that, mm -hmm. presumably, um, because we uh, we talk about the things that don't don't even make it out of committee, never mind getting to CPAC itself. Um, and so I just want to make sure that the folks who made the request understand the process that's going on and kind of where they are in it. My understanding is that they could appeal, essentially, even though even though the uh, Historical Commission is not recommending that money, these folks could, like anybody who um, their committee was, or uh, their proposal was not supported by the committee to whom they recommended it, could then go to the CPAC grand meeting and make their case. Is that right? I suppose I should say too the process is really just starting up now. Mr. Zomek no, may know more. Usually it's in the course ar around the middle of September or so, late August, whenever we issue that is the town issues a request for suggestions for these projects, and Ms. Stein can talk about this too. They come to the committee structure, then toward the end of the calendar year they move forward and reach CPAC for formal deliberation early in the next year. So this is this is really very preliminary given the, the pattern of requests in the past. Okay. I just want to make sure they're kind of yeah. informed about it so that they're not hanging out there I having no idea what, yeah. what anything is missed. Time. CPAC is having its first meeting this week, Thursday. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Zomek, did you want to add anything? You don't need to, uh, if you want to. No. Thursday is the first meeting, and Mr. Wald was correct. Um, I mean, there there is an opportunity for the group to come in and make a, you know, they could make a presentation uh, regardless of what the recommendation is from the Historical Commission. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Burr. And, and again, it's just a recommendation, obviously, because I'm not on either of these bodies and we're liaisons to them. But just I think it is good to continue to formalize those kinds of things because sometimes it's people who know, people who understand the system better that's in each individual community because everybody does their CPA committee a little differently even though they're all under state law. I think it would be great if Historic Commission does at some point say, no thank you, but the next step is you go direct to them rather than just you're out of luck and then they find out later, oh, we wish we had gone directly to them because it may be that in another community it, it works differently. And so even though I personally want to say no to this particular project, I agree that they need to understand the process so that they don't end up feeling short whatever. Um, Mr. Wall, does that seem like something that would be reasonable for you to um, relay to them from us or to staff or whatever, just to sort of keep them informed? Just that whole transparency thing. Okay. All right. Uh, other liaison reports? Mr. Hayden. Hey, now we've wrapped up that. Um, a couple. The uh, Recycling and Refuse Management Committee is working on a project to uh, reduce waste. Um, well, had to develop policy to reduce waste. An interesting um, little sidelight came out of that meeting. They are also wrestling with um, 
the problem that um, the transfer station will be closing probably a year earlier, well, well, a year earlier than um, we had expected and probably at all because the, um, uh, it turns out, it's funny how these things all get connected because the um, solar farm, so the PV farm um, is on hold. One of the things that it was gonna support was the transfer station which in turn supports the folks in town who only recycle and don't have much trash already. So that's all gonna go away now. So that's something they're dealing with right now. Um, ARA, um, we are uh, working uh, with um, the final recommendations out of the um, visioning study that we had, which generated um, suggestions for some further studies. Um, we, um, came across the idea, we, we, we support the idea that it's no longer just a gateway uh, process, but it's a gateway in downtown, sort of Kendrick Park, that whole area. Because we discovered in the visioning process, we all discovered in the process, that people understood a much broader area needed to be brought together under the uh, whatever rubric there is for, for designing. So there'll be a number of studies. Um, we'll probably have some requests of town meeting this fall for um, um, resources to go ahead with the uh, various studies. Um, interesting, the um, planning board now has a liaison to the ARA, which I think is a very good idea. Um, speaking of the planning board, the public, uh, the zoning subcommittee um, had a very um, a nice presentation of the, the village center, the two village center zoning um, proposals that will be in front of town meeting this fall. Um, they met uh, basically in preparation for the public hearing that the planning board had later that evening um, where we heard a lot of, or where a, a lot of the same concerns were heard that we had heard in the, the zoning subcommittee. So they're gearing up for um, um, bringing that forward and really um, informing town meeting members. It's a it's very interesting, it, it's while it's a simple idea, um, because it's two simple ideas that are lying on top of each other, it gets confusing. And, and so there's a lot of work that's gonna be done to try to pull them apart so people can understand how form-based code, I, I forgot to mention that this, this, this zoning that we're talking about is a form-based code, which will be lying on top of the current zoning um, by way of a very brief explanation, the zoning, the underlying zoning, the current, the original zoning, regulates the use. The form-based codes which are being put on top of it will regulate the form that those uses, the buildings that those uses go into. E easy to say, hard to understand. Um, and the, um, the town meeting coordinating committee is meeting uh, Thursday. Um, they have a number of things on their agenda which I can't speak to yet because I haven't been to the meeting. But I will mention that there has been some effort, some headway on uh, trying to straighten out the sound issues um, for town meeting. Um, I've met with um, um, Brian Eccleston, who is the technical director for the schools, and I've had a long conversation with Jim Lesko, and um, we've come up with a number of, of improvements um, some sort of better heads put together that we hope to be trotting out in front of town meeting this fall. We'll talk about that on Thursday as well. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, the form-based code, did you want to add anything to that zoning thing, Mr. Wall? Just briefly, if I could, since I was at that meeting as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Mr. Hayden is, is quite correct, except maybe I'd say it's easy to describe and easy to understand, but still people are not getting it. <laughs> Part of the problem, not a problem, it was a nice presentation, but what the Cecil group talked about was specific plans for these two areas. That's complicated too, two very different parts of town, North Amherst Center and Atkins Corner. And so this meeting itself did not contain, I think you would say an explicit definition or elaboration on form-based codes. And most of the concerns I had to do had to do with, as Mr. Hayden said, use. So people would say, they saw proposals for types of things and they, they we heard the same kind of concerns about student housing and crowding and, and, and so forth. So I think we have some, some homework to do as a, as a town government to make sure that people understand these issues very clearly. And uh, 
the sooner the better because time gets tight as we go on. So that's an excellent point. This is one of the things that town meeting members should have as sort of in their tool chest of preparation and homework going forward. It won't answer every question. It will raise some questions, but there will be other venues for continuing to try and answer those questions. But town meeting members should definitely try and watch that meeting, which is on ACTV and, and can be streamed live on the website. I should say Amherst Media. I apologize. Mm -hmm. And that meeting was September 7th. 7th correct. Yeah. There's also really great information on the town website that uh, our own staff have put up explaining these things. So I'd urge people to take a look at that very carefully. Thank you very much. Ms. Reed. The only piece that's missing right now is the final proposal, the final form based. Uh, I think it's very close to being mounted, a draft is very close to being mounted on the website. Um, I would um, just, just remind um, our viewers who are interested in these things and go look at that draft that it's not finished. Um, there are lots of details. Um, but the concepts are very are clear and well, I think are clear, and certainly um, um, what's presented um, can help guide questions or queries. Yeah. And and so that's a starting po point for folks. This yeah, should be their absolutely. introduction, and then we can see where their where their questions lead and how those need to be addressed. Okay, other liaison reports. Oh, sorry, Mr. Wall. To follow up with that, if it's not inappropriate, you know, some of us here have gotten, Mr. Hayden is an expert in this stuff, Ms. Brewer and I have dealt with it to some extent. We'd, we're happy to talk to people too. If people have questions, they can address them to us. Thank and then just to follow up on the CPAC thing, uh, double check my notes here. So what the action that the commission took was to direct its reply directly to CPAC. So I don't know whether that requires a separate reply on our part. Uh, that's the state of things right now though. Okay, yeah, I think we're just wanting to make sure that the folks who, who applied have some idea of what yep. comes next so that they're not just hanging out there wondering what we did with their request. Okay, other liaison reports. Uh, I think I might have a couple. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Brewer. Wow, I mean, have a reason <laughs> we should talk enough, about sorry. my committees. So, uh, Committee on Homelessness and Housing Partnership for Housing Committee will have many angry emails to me um, very mo in moments, I'm sure. Um, but I, I'm confident that the way we're moving forward makes sense and that I will have a lot of conversations with them as I have been over the time. Um, Community Development Block Grant uh, Advisory Committee is proceeding apace. Luckily, we did appoint two new members. They have been sworn in, and Nate Malloy is working on giving them a, a real you know, orientation as to what they're getting into, and they both had some familiarity with the projects prior to that, so that was great. And so that's feeling better because they have enough people on CDBG Advisory Committee that they think they can get through the entire process, whereas that was looking a little iffy when um, they only had four members. So that's a plus, um, obviously making progress on the housing and shelter issues, and the only other committees that I'm currently affiliated with, Disability Access Advisory Committee, as I mentioned last time, is something I'm having a hard time making it to, but maybe I'll have more time to do that now. Uh, they tend to meet at 11.15 on Tuesdays out at Stavros, and they meet tomorrow. And Leisure Services is meeting Wednesday night, and I will attempt to go to that. And one of the things that they'll be talking about is an update on where things are with being able to be ready for War Memorial Pool to be open next summer, which I know people will be, ex and I will be leaning on them about the fact that town meeting will, in the fall, will want some kind of report on what's happening with that. And so hopefully they will be prepared with whatever aspect of that they can work on. So that would be good. And the other thing that's probably part of your chair's report, because I know we talked about it at the last meeting, was this, <coughs> I gotta say, a little bit odd mailing we got as town meeting members that's just kind of a bunch of random stuff that's financial stuff and calendar, et cetera. So exactly where this came from and how this was put together might be cool to know. <laughs> okay, so I didn't actually open that um, <laughs> because I thought I knew what it was. Um, so this was supposed yeah, to be, stuff. this yeah. was our, uh, the year-end report yep. for the fiscal year yep. uh, with a cover memo from Andy Steinberg, chair of the finance committee. That didn't make it in? Well, no, because it's, a, it's the report that's to us. And so it's just a little funny that it doesn't say, dear town meeting members, read this. Okay, so, yeah. so there was so a, there we'll was, a there was cover. Okay, so this is one of these things that kind of the end result came together last week while we were yeah. dealing with crises. It, it went the to town meeting members. It, there's a lot of good material in it. It, it went to town, right. So it just doesn't have quite as everything you were looking for. It's just why not as clear <laughs> why they got it, but right. who they got it from. So it's like four different things, but it went to town meeting members. 
and it's all it's good. stuff we have all seen before. Okay, so so what this was supposed to be was the report that we had voted yeah. or, and decided that would get sent year end um, to town meeting members. Um, I'm not clear why the cover memo from Mr. Steinberg will be very upset, and apologies, Mr. Steinberg, uh, chair of the finance committee. Mm -hmm. and that was supposed to be part of that report. The other stuff that's in there is from town meeting coordinating committee that I understand it was going to be a three-page thing from them, yep. a calendar, and some explanation perhaps? Yep. Okay. So <laughs> they, yeah. town meeting coordinating committee is working very hard to try and give town meeting members a much broader exposure to um, the budget process. So they've been working t with feedback from me, all kinds of different folks from different committees on what the calendar, the budget development calendar looks like going forward. This is a, a working, a living document, but it's, an, it's a way to let town meeting members know that here's a whole bunch of process going on here, things that you should be paying attention to and be aware of and, uh, and you know, participate in if you can. So that's what that was supposed to be, and clearly we're going to need to put some email communication out to folks so they have more information about this. Ms. Stein? I, I think what they needed was a cover letter saying, here are four documents because you are a town meeting member yeah, that exactly. you would be interested in. Mm -hmm. And instead it came across, my, when I opened it, I thought, why are we getting this all again? <laughs> um, and my husband opened why? it and I said, well, I think now I understand what happened. It's to inform you about town yeah. for town meeting. Okay. So that's what was missing. Okay. Otherwise, it's a great idea. And just to make you feel a little better, Andy Steinberg's memo was the last thing. <laughs> and so oh, but it they, is in there. It, it's yeah. in there. You wouldn't think they went together, but it's in there. So, you know, we just need a little work on the execution. But the And so I'm not complaining. I'm simply saying that we might want to put something out on the website that or something that says, hey, town meeting members, did you get your mail in? this is really cool because it actually has you know this brand new document that talks about how to contact JCPC and stuff it's very helpful I just am afraid they'll ignore it because they won't know why they have it okay thank you I'm glad to know that and that's what happens when you don't open your mail okay <laughs> but I, I didn't open it because I thought I knew what it was and so uh, so so just so people are clear and Mr. Steinberg in particular your memo your is in, in there it just it's was not, not quite paginated correctly uh, and piled okay yeah, it's been one of those weeks. Okay, <laughs> um, <laughs> other uh, liaison reports before I... We're going to have some. <laughs> okay, so let's see, mine. Um, Amherst Housing Authority, I haven't made it to that lately, just as I always say, I can't. But um, as I mentioned before, they are in the midst of creating a process for um, uh, finding a new director, executive director for the Housing Authority, so I will check in on them with that and see how that's going and see if they need any assistance from us. Conservation Commission, they are having a public meeting on, well, all their meetings are public, they're having a big public meeting on September 28th, is that correct, Mr. Gilmore? Yeah, which is going to be talking about um, the policy for dogs on conservation land. There have been a lot of really serious issues happening at Amethyst Brook. Um, and they are looking to clarify and perhaps take action on um, what the what the dog policy is going to be going forward. There are just a couple of places in town, Amethyst Brook uh, and Mill River, are I believe the only ones of conservation land. Not to be confused with Mill River recreation land, but of the conservation land, Mill River and Amethyst Brook are the only places where you're allowed to have your dog off leash um, currently. Uh, and so they're going to be looking at whether or not they're able to continue to do that for everyone's safety. And that is, again, Wednesday, September 28th. Um, budget coordinating group has not met yet. Uh, Mr. Steinberg, who is co-chair with me on that, uh, and I have been talking about when to first meet, considering the situation with the town manager um, and considering the four boards meeting on October 13th, which is our big meeting uh, to really start off the budget process, give us the most information. We expect the first BCG meeting to be after that. Campus and Community Coalition did not meet because it didn't have enough members a couple weeks ago. Council on Aging meets tomorrow. I missed their previous meeting. And I think that's all I have to report for liaison reports. Anybody else on that? Okay, Ms. Brewer. I just wondered if Mr. Zemeck, with all the different hats here you guys are wearing, um, could clarify. I know there was something about a sign being put up at Amethyst or Mill River, and what was the sign clarifying? Now I can't remember, because we just did this. Mr. Zemeck. The sign was clarifying the current policy that allowing dogs off leash but under voice control is, is allowed. And so that was at the request of a number of um, dog owners who use Amethyst Brook 
uh, for walking their dogs. There's been so many incidents down there this summer that tensions are very high. And so before the hurricane, we put up a, a nice new laminated sign there. And I hope it made it through the weather. And um, so. Yes. Uh, so folks who, who have a particular interest in that one way or the other should definitely attend definitely. that Conservation Commission meeting on September 28th. Okay, uh, open meeting law update, Ms. Brewer, anything? What do you got? <laughs> 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 yes, <but it's> <laughs> well, I do. Um, I'm working on the quorum issue um, because our lawyer and the folks at the uh, um, attorney general's office have different ideas of what should represent a quorum. And um, I did have a correspondence with the man who's, he's going to pursue this further. He, he had kind of let it slide, I think. But it's really an issue because we have committees that are actually meeting without a quorum. They think they have a quorum and they don't, according to um, Mr. Bard. So I'm very eager. I might, it would be my hope that they would include a definition of the quorum in the open meeting law. And I think I might actually ask that. They don't have it in there at this point. Right. They have a ruling that they give people, which differs from <laughs> what Mr. Bard said. So um, otherwise, you know, uh, we have to think about rewriting charges for committees that are having trouble maintaining their membership. Right. So it's, it's very, just so folks remember, this is something we talked about several weeks ago or several meetings ago, about whether a quorum is defined as a majority of the seats that are supposed to be on the committee or um, by the majority of the people who are currently filling the seats. And so the town's practice has long been the former, that it's based on if you've got a seven-person committee, you need a four-person quorum. Some people, and including a, a, a rather disturbing um, uh, ruling or, or advice from the Attorney General's office consider the quorum to be if you've got three absences on your seven-person committee, then you've only got four people, so now you know three is a quorum or whatever. Um, that it's a very different concept, and so we need clarification because we all have opinions on it, but the opinions don't matter. We need, we need clarity. So thank you, Ms. Stein, for um, looking into that. Ms. Brewer. And not to belabor it, but the other reason it's complicated is because some types of committees, just like things like CPAC, have a relationship to actual mass general law as opposed to just some committee we made up because we knew it was cool and it was a good idea. Um, some bodies have it defined in state law what it means. And if you can even interpret what the words say is yet another issue. And so most of those most of the decisions that have been made around what counts as a quorum are for really big deal committees like planning boards and zoning boards of appeals. They don't think about, well, what happens if a sister city committee has 15 seats on it but only has eight people who are particularly interested in serving right now? Is that reasonable? And it's hard to fit everything into those legalistic terms. So. We keep trying to plug away, get clarification. Okay. Uh, let's see, before we do the chair's report, let's do untimed items, and before we do any of the untimed items, let's do the Stavros parking request from 645. Um, this was, this is a request that we get uh, every year or every several years or however often they do this, and um, we wanted to give them the opportunity to come in and publicize their event, as we often do for folks, or as uh, we always do for folks, and we didn't hear back in time whether or not they wanted to take advantage of that opportunity, so we left it on the agenda, um, but it is a pretty straightforward request, so. Um, Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? Sure. I move that the select board approve the reservation of parking spaces on the west side of Boltwood Avenue and the east side of South Pleasant Street from Spring Street to College Street on September 17, 2011 from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. for the Starbro Center for Independent Living's American with Disabilities Act ADA celebration. Second. Further discussion? Mr. Hayden. Just, just a quick note that um, this is not um, uh, to prevent parking in those spa spaces, but to give the Stavros uh, vendors and certain guests access. Right. So it's not that you won't see anybody parking there at all. Right, it's to accommodate a lot of uh, yeah. handicap parking, et cetera. Okay. Uh, further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 It's unanimous. Okay, uh, next up we have taxi licenses. Okay, I move that the select board approve the new taxi driver slash chauffeur license for Chief Usman Diedhuyo. 
13 Arlington Street, East Hampton, Mass, on behalf of Taxi Express. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 I move that the select board approve the new taxi driver slash chauffeur license for Christy A. Speck, 101 State Street, Amherst, Mass, on behalf of Green Transportation. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 I move that the select board approve the new taxi driver slash chauffeur license for Christian Kayago, 59 Skyline Drive, West Springfield, Mass., on behalf of Zeke Taxi Company. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I, mo I move that the select board approve the new taxi driver slash chauffeur license for Sarah Hickey, 27 Montague Road, Amherst, MA on behalf of Tic Tac Taxi. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay, now let's do the, uh, the annual town report draft. I sent folks on Saturday uh, an annual report. This is our annual report. <laughs> what a description. We have to do this every year about the previous fiscal year and this goes into our big annual report. Uh, every committee is called upon and department is called on to do them. Uh, I went through all of our post meeting lists from FY11 and pulled out all of the things that I thought were most relevant. Um, over the weekend, Ms. Stein did offer some edits to that document, which I appreciated. Um, they are all very minor if you read either the original version or the new version, which is on your desk, which you would have received this morning. Um, I don't think anybody would have a single issue with any of her edits um, because they're sort of just a little bit of, you know, yeah. Um, the one major difference is the, uh, she suggested, which was a good suggestion for formatting to um, make bulletized the advocacy section, which had been primarily a paragraph before. Anybody have any particular issues with what was or wasn't in the annual report? Would someone like to make a motion to approve uh, this version of the annual report with Ms. Stein's uh, revisions? Is there a motion on the motion sheet or am I ad living? That's a good question. Uh, there is one. Says, yes, there is a motion. It's near the top. I move that the select board approve the draft of the annual town report created by Stephanie O'Keefe. We'll call it dated whatever. 9, 12, 11. We'll call it draft two just so it's clear to be different from the draft one because it does say draft two at the top. Uh, for the discussion, I'm sorry, that was seconded? Yes. That was second. I Thank seconded. you, Mr. Heaton. I, I'm just amazed that all of that can ha can fit into five pages. I I, uh, <laughs> I appreciate, I have no complaint at all with it. It's very concise and I think uh, it's great reading. Thank you very much. It's, it's actually rather fun to go through all it's that amazing, stuff yeah. and, uh, we and see what we did. We get a great deal accomplished. We really do. We do an, an excellent job of managing things yeah, and being productive. <laughs> and um, right. yeah, the, the report is a good kind of a, a wake up call of, wow, you know, <laughs> we're doing good work here. Okay, um, further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 And that was unanimous, correct? Everyone said aye? Yes, yes. Okay. Did. Thank you. So now I will do the chair's report and then we will deal with minutes. And I got a, a new toy here. I'm trying to make it work for me. Okay. Agenda. Chair's report. Yes. All right. We had scheduled a meeting. Um, we hadn't, I don't know if we officially scheduled the timing or not, but we had talked conceptually about our October 7th meeting being at nine o'clock. This is our what has lately become our standard uh, Friday early morning meeting to sign the warrant four weeks before each town meeting um, because there's always a conflict related to the Monday night that's related to that. Uh, that, that helps us with the four week thing. So this gives us four weeks plus a couple days. However, the MMA legislative breakfast, fall legislative breakfast is happening in Sunderland on that day and that goes until 10 o'clock. Um, I suspect most or all of us will be there. So I'm wondering if there's another time that day that we could meet early that would still allow us to get the warrant posted on that Friday. So the earliest, I think, considering we'd be starting in Sunderland would be 11 
you know, is, is 11 or 12 or one good potentially for folks at all there? Ms. Brewer? Uh, can I ask a question? October 7th, 7th Friday. October Friday yeah. sorry. Do we happen to know if there's any legal reason why we can't call a meeting in Sunderland? <laughs> <laughs> for just this simple reason, because it, it's it's handicap accessible, it's publicly noted, it's not something we take any public comment on. There's absolutely no discussion. All we do is sign the bloody thing. I, I, I do we have to do that? Like, but isn't I mean, life tough what, enough? <laughs> what are we going to come back? I mean, no, that seems very easy to we me. All have to the come location back. is yeah. just where it is. Yeah, we all have to come back. The to location at some point. is the public building that we're. It's not like we're just going if to the bar. I mean, it's it's a public building. <laughs> I prefer going to the bar off. <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's accessible, I'm good. Yeah. Um, I, I guess, no, forget what I was going to say. We could all go in one car and post the meeting for 10 <laughs> 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 yeah. No, post the meeting worse. for here. Location, uh, Prius. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I'm, I'm gay for that. Right. No, I'm um, just trying to shorten so we do it, but you have to give a specific time, so it would have to be 11. So so here's one thing. One is uh, we don't all go to the legislative breakfast, and we might not all be available from that time. So we do all try and sign the warrant because it's right. peculiar to not have all of our names on the warrant. So I think that the legislative breakfast, even though that's an interesting idea to explore, um, um, I think that that would commit people maybe to the legislative breakfast that they weren't able to make that commitment. Um, so going back to the idea of 11 or noon, uh, as throw those out there date uh, times, is anybody? I'm at work till noon, but after that I'm free. I can sneak away. So I'm sorry, tell me what time you're good I'm from? I'm busy through noon, but I could get away after that briefly. Okay. So what about 12.15? Would that work? 12.30? Well, yeah, well, close to 12 as possible. Yeah. 12.10? 12. 10? 12. <laughs> Just after 12-ish, could people do that? Yeah, can we post, post that meeting? For 12? Can we post oh, the meeting at 12-ish? Is that quite <laughs> Yeah, 12-ish in a that Prius on the point. way to Sunday. Okay, we're getting kind of punchy well, here. Yeah, yeah. All right, um, we'll post the meeting for 12 o'clock, and we'll get here just as soon as we can. How about that? Okay, okay. so that's going to be noon on 10-7. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Okay, next we have um, recent and upcoming meetings and events. I got notes here. Okay, we had a very, very lovely September 11th uh, uh, commemoration yesterday, um, and I really appreciated all the folks who turned out for that. I really appreciated uh, Chief Nelson from the fire department putting that together, and also the participation of uh, Chief Livingstone from the police department and all of the the folks from the police force, from UMass police force, from the Amherst fire department, from even the student force at the fire department who participated in that. Uh, the veterans agent was there, the lovely bell ceremony and everything, it, it was it was very nice. And so uh, I just wanna, uh, and the select board members were there, four of us were there, uh, Mr. Zomek was there, it was great. Ms. Brewer? Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I may have scowled on camera because I was scowling at the newspaper table for not covering it. And um, I wanted to make that clear to the viewing public, but the Collegian covered it. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate the Collegian bothering to recognize that we were there because it is, it is a ceremony that some people said they were not aware of. So we're trying to figure out another way to tell people beyond the town website because people mm -hmm. tend to depend on the newspapers to tell them this stuff. I will note that Mr. Mersbach did a very nice front page story in the bulletin last week about it, so to some degree, I'm yeah. not sure how, right. like, you we're know. gonna fly planes with, you know, banners. Um, exactly. And also, I understand that Mr. Mersbach is going to be doing a, uh, a follow-up story for well, this how week. very oh, nice. Very lovely. Mr. Walden, just question. Just briefly, there was a, you know, there was a, a wide choice of events. There was an interfaith yes. service, yeah, well. walk around the common, and so forth. I also went last night to the, the nighttime ceremony on the common, uh, that Larry Kelly and Kevin Joy had organized. There was support also from town staff there because there was a fire engine, a police car. Uh, Chief Nelson was going to speak, but he was engaged with some uh, urgent business at the fire department, so he was not able to. But a number of local veterans spoke, some younger ones, some older ones, and so forth. So that was another chance to, to talk in particular about the role of public safety and veterans. Thank you very much. Mr. Hayden. I just wanted to apologize for not meeting you on the common. I couldn't get out of the bell tower quickly enough after I played. Oh, exciting. Oh, nice. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, indeed. 
Uh, okay, other couple things. Um, I had told you I was going to do a column for the Collegian Welcoming Students. Um, the events of last week have thrown me a bit off course. I still hope to do that. Now, it will be instead of saying just like, welcome to students, it'll be now that you've gotten <laughs> settled or whatever, but I, that is still on my list. Um, and also, I'll note that uh, I uh, took Mr. Musanti's place at the Applewood 20th celebration last Thank week. You. That was on Wednesday the 7th. They're 20 years old. It's hard to imagine. Um, and, and that was just fantastic. Oh. They had folks there who were part of the original board who created the very concept of Applewood. They had folks who have been among the original residents still there. Um, they also gave these various little awards and recognitions to folks who had been there, you know, 10 years or whatever in different intervals. Um, they sang. They had a little skit. It was lovely. It was really, really delightful. Um, Representative Story was there and uh, and was great. Um, I spoke on Mr. Musanti's behalf and everyone was, that was the day that it had had in the paper about um, him being in critical condition, which we learned that day was in error. And folks were just so happy to learn that, um, that people, it was just that people's whole focus of attention, kind of as I was talking to them beforehand, and then when I was talking to them afterwards, was how he was doing. And, and so when I was able to share that we had the new information, uh, they were very pleased. So that was a lovely event. Um, okay, I think that's all my chair's report. Anybody have any other questions or comments for me? Okay, then the I believe the final thing we have. Oh no, I'm sorry. Special liquor licenses. Let's yes. do those. May I make the motion? Yes, please. I move that the select board approve the special wine and malt licenses for Meredith Schmidt, Campus Center Director, on behalf of UMass Amherst for receptions to be held at the Fine Arts Center from 6:30 to 10 p.m. on October 12, 2011, October 19, 2011. November 8, 2011, November 10th, 2011, and November 16th, 2011. Second. Further discussion. I will note, because I know that Ms. Brewer is going to wonder about this, um, we've got this new thing that we know about Count. that there's a limit of 30 per year per person, um, and I believe that this puts Ms. Schmidt up to 25, so UMass has been notified that they need somebody else to, to make the, uh, the, the uh, applications under, and so... Uh, that will happen. Um, okay, further discussion? Was it seconded? I'm sorry. Yes, further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 And that was unanimous. Okay, I think then the, the only other thing we have to do is minutes, and um, we have a very nice stack of minutes here. Um, we do have a couple of sets that are outstanding from <coughs> Ms. Brewer. <Yeah>. Um, and uh, <laughs> Not to name names or So <laughs> we have... We've got, uh, it, it, these are fantastic and, and really well done. Miss Stein had um, just the smallest of edits to any of them. I also have the smallest of edits. Some of them might overlap Miss Stein's edits. Um, is there anything about them that folks need to talk about rather than just saying that's fine with the edits, Mr. Hayden? Yes, the, the uh, July 5th minutes are not. It's a minute. <laughs> Wise guy, okay. Anything else that we need yeah, to I talk about to rather than them just as corrected? Uh, Ms. Brewer and then Mr. Wall. <laughs> I, I will hand my corrections to Ms. Stein, but basically uh, January 24th, we didn't do present and absent, which we're now in the habit of doing. And uh, Alyssa was present because if she wasn't, she sure did talk a lot during the <laughs> And I'm pretty sure it was Mr. Wald who was absent since Who's I, so unusually he didn't talk at all. Um, so, and the other thing I just wanted to clarify is which members and the town manager had gone to the MMA meeting, because although we don't have in this particular, oh, good. <laughs> you want <laughs> this Eric to go back? To Eric? Actually, what what I'll do is I'll take them from you, and I'm going to give them all to the office, and they're just going to yeah. okay. they'll take care of those. So just make so your your edits very five. clear, um, so that okay. they can incorporate them all because they have the electronic versions. Ms. Stein, um, there are a couple of things that I would like drop but I think they're so minor that we could leave them in that same category, um, except possibly the minutes of June 13th where we had a roll call vote um, twice, once to go into executive session and once to come out, and I don't remember that we've ever had it to come out. To adjourn the meeting? I don't know. I don't remember. Okay, I won't pretend I remember. All right. So June 13th, if you look at the very last page above adjourn, 
Well, okay. actually, that's, that's a piece of the minute from the executive session. That would yeah. be the last item in the executive session. Right. This is not the executive session minute. So it should come out, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I'll give you the other two are minor drops. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So we're all comfortable with just approving right. them as amended with these little teeny right. fixes without talking about them. The only question I had for Mr. Heaton on the January, January 24th thing was the only thing I couldn't figure out was on um, page two of the minutes, um, talking all about the um, committee on homelessness, et cetera, uh, where we had forecast for deadly cold in Connecticut River Valley. Mr. Musanti had worked with AFD, APD, BIS, and I didn't know who that was. Does anybody know who BIS is? BIS and the church to open it. I would have corrected it, except I didn't know what it corrected to. Yep. Do you have any idea BOH. what you were talking about? Board of Health? No, it wouldn't be the Board of Health anyway. It would be the health director. I'm just trying to come up with an answer. Okay. okay. Well, we'll just maybe strike that as a yeah. Yeah. unknowable. Just, uh, yeah, just leave that <laughs> organization off. Okay. That's what we heard last night. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. Then, uh, it would somebody like to make a motion we've got a motion here yes okay, perfect yeah, could someone make the it. motion from the motion sheet and we'll say as amended rather than as presented actually do oh, we have it's it it's, it's not bis it's ais we have that which is what amherst inspection services oh. nobody calls it that okay so we'll, well uh, those we of can us just who why don't we just <laughs> put in <laughs> inspection yes. services but you can because put otherwise services. we'll all be wondering right. what it means anyway. right okay. that's good all right, all right. That's what we'll i do. move that the select board accept the minutes of january 24th 2011 february 7th 2011 april 4th 2011 june 13th 2011 june 27th 2011 july 5th 2011 and july 18th 2011 as amended. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Did you note I changed the motion? To as amended. Yes, I did. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, and back to my agenda. So. Can I raise my hand? Certainly. Just a, a brief question. Uh, I, it may be irrelevant because I hope we're through with this era of minutes by us since you and the town manager and now acting town manager are doing such a great job. But it would be helpful to me, especially because the changes are mostly totally, totally trivial and minute, if we got track changes because, I, I, you know, unless we know what's being, I mean, we can just approve them if they look okay, but we don't know what was changed, if it's a missing word, if it's the wrong word. So it's helpful to me to see what the original was when things are corrected, if it's more than inserting a comma, even if it's not. But future uh, reference. Do, do people want track change? To me, that makes them really long and to be honest, I deal with the minutes like usually right before the meeting, so I'm just kind of going through, going, "Oh, keep spelled wrong. Oh, keep spelled wrong." Yeah, I guess <laughs> it depends on the level of anality we want to get into. But right now, they're all they're all trivial changes anyway. So I don't know, you know. Yeah, you can't you can't even discuss them because they look okay. So I don't know. Right, right. It, so, do you have any discomfort with having approved them the way that we just did that? Or no, I just. Okay, so substantive stuff for sure. We yeah. should be doing track changes with. Or, you know, it can be just a strike through. It doesn't have to be the formal track changes mechanism, but something that indicates what the change is or why it's so important. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Ms. I, I went to the system of just putting in what I changed it to in red so you could skim carefully next to your Smart. regular set. And then it's easy. You do one fill, select cut black, and all the red goes away. So that way you can look at the old and the new side by side and it goes very fast. If you want to have Track to side changes by side are harder to read, I think, yeah. but I can do it. I don't Red, mind. Blue italics, underlined. Okay, I think we're done with the minutes then and we have a concept <laughs> for next time. You don't even time. want to talk about how to deal with the minutes. No, oh, okay. have I missed anything on the agenda that somebody sees that I don't see? No. Mm. All right, then uh, calendar preview I think is pretty straightforward coming up and then without objection, this meeting. I would move to adjourn. Mr. Hayden moved to adjourn at 922. Thank you very much. Good night.